Good morning, everybody in Rovaniemi and elsewhere. I'm very happy to join in uh, for this important day. As has been mentioned in my capacity as part-time professor of Indigenous Peoples' Rights at the University of Lapland, I'm the main organizer of the event. The Faculty of Law is hosting it. And as you have heard, we have the support by both the Ministry of Justice and the Sami Parliament. It has been really uh, a pleasant process towards organizing this event. My view, which I have uh, presented also in the media, is that an expert seminar like this cannot resolve the political issues related to the amendments to the Sami Parliament Act, but it can hopefully clarify by cleaning the table so that the legal issues are resolved or at least understood better and what remains is really a political discourse which takes its course and there are politics within the Sami Parliament and the Sami community and there are politics within the Finnish nation and the Finnish parliament and both will have to agree uh, on adopting the amended Sami Parliament Act. So I hope that this experts seminar can facilitate uh, resolution of remaining open issues so that it is clarified that they are political in nature and hopefully can be resolved. I want to say something about the process towards this event. The idea emerged during the work of the drafting commission when uh, one member, Dr. Juha Jona, who unfortunately is not with us today, uh, quite early on in the work of the commission said that he will dissent uh, from the report. Basically, he was dissenting uh, to the mandate given by the Finnish government to the drafting commission. So there was very little difficulty to reach agreement. Uh, he was listened to and if he had made any amendment proposals ever, they would have been considered. But his approach was that he will dissent. He presented legal arguments, which are now reflected in the written dissenting opinion you have all seen as an English translation and also in the Finnish original as part of the actual report. And we see that there are issues framed as disagreement as to whether the proposals comply with international norms. Fine. My presentation now is making the case for. I'm making the case why I believe that the uh, drafting commission's proposals are compatible with international law, more so required by international law. At the end, I will present some quotes from Dr. Juhayona's dissenting opinion as authentic quotes, just to have them on the table in the discussion to see that what is the case against compatibility between international norms and the proposals made by the drafting commission. We will discuss the issues during the day, but I do want to present also the case against. It is unfortunate that Dr. Jona did not accept the invitation to speak here. The, my idea was that we too would present the case for and the case against, and then the rest of the day would be spent assessing those two positions. This was, uh, the invitation was extended to Dr. Jona in one of the early meetings of the drafting commission and still in uh, June he confirmed that he will attend and will be happy to speak. But on 7 of July he retracted and said he cannot participate. And unfortunately he referred uh, to the fact that some members of the Sami parliament would not be allowed to speak here. But that was never true. Every single member of the Sami parliament has received an individual invitation to this event and been told that the word is free. Everybody will be allowed and encouraged to present their position. So this is not meant as a one-sided event where only one view is presented and prevails. It's much more interesting and important to hear all views and we have done our best to facilitate it. It's, uh, I'm sure the, the so-called dissenting voices 
will be reflected and represented here, particularly in the afternoon when we, we will be able to open the microphones for the participants. In the early part, when we hear international experts, we will uh, uh, facilitate questions through chat, but later on there will be a much more interactive phase in the event. I will move to my uh, PowerPoint presentation. I start from the notion of indigenous peoples, and I intentionally say notion instead of concept, and I don't say definition, I, I speak about the notion. There have been efforts uh, to define the notion of indigenous peoples, to come to a conceptual definition, and uh, those who know my academic work know that I'm a conceptual thinker and conceptual lawyer. I, I do like uh, conceptual approaches and being precise in the use of language. But there are good reasons why international law doesn't actually have a conceptual definition of indigenous peoples. And it's, it, 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 it's because the world is so diverse and evolving, and also because those groups themselves have a say in defining themselves. And having a definition adopted by states, for instance, in the form of an international treaty, would be problematic. What is the legitimacy of states in defining indigenous peoples? So I think it's useful to say we have efforts to define, we have criteria also in international treaties, but not a uniform definition of indigenous peoples. The most common, most, most authoritative uh, effort to define indigenous pe peoples is the so-called Martinez-Cobo definition from the old sub-commission uh, of the uh, UN Commission on Human Rights dealing with uh, minorities uh, and, and discrimination. Next slide, please. Here I have distilled some elements which would be part of a concept or definition of indigenous peoples. You will note that they are collective in nature. It's about a group or a culture which has been present in a specific area, can be a country, can be an area wider than current state borders, present there before the arrival of the currently dominant population or the drawing of current state borders. Secondly, the natural environment, the lands have given rise to a distinct form of life, distinct culture, based on the preconditions in the area, which uh, then result in distinctiveness as a way of life, as a form of life, as a culture. And thirdly, there is cultural continuity from that state from the situation before the arrival of the current dominant population, the natural resources giving rise to a culture which has been in one or the other form, perhaps modernized, preserved, so that today the group is distinctive compared to the mainstream population as to its way of life. And finally, there's a perspective into the future. This group today existing as a distinct culture, it wishes to preserve its way of life and to transmit it to future generations. We are speaking of a collective, we are speaking of a culture which uh, uh, has a long history and which is present today and will be preserved also to the future. Next slide, please. Where we have that kind of a conceptual approach is elements of indigenous peoples notion in the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples yeah. and in ILO 169. ILO 169 comes closer to a definition. The UN Declaration doesn't even try to have a definition, but the elements can be found if you read through the text of the declaration. But if you are conceptual and define uh, indigenous peoples, where emphasis is on the notion of being first, being before the currently dominant population. Then you come to realize that actually there will be similarly situated groups and reasons of equality and justice 
may call for extending the same protections to other groups as well. They were perhaps not first, such as descendants of the slaves that were brought to Europe from Europe to South America or Central America form today. But the ILO takes it in the form of tribal peoples. So indigenous or tribal is the approach of ILO, where then both types of groups enjoy the same protections. There will be then differences in fact, which for instance relate to land rights. You cannot pr 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 uh, prove a long historical tradition concerning the possession of lands. You may have different land rights under Article 14, etc. But nevertheless, the protection is extended. And this is a trend in modern international law, that even if you had take a conceptual approach to the notion of indigenous peoples and define them as being first, you then are likely to extend that protection to other similarly situated groups. ILO does it through the notion of tribal peoples. The Africa Commission and African Court of Human and Peoples Rights, they have started from the idea all Africans are indigenous to Africa. And then it doesn't really matter who was most indigenous in a particular area within Africa. It depends on the current way of life, the culture. Are they nomads? Are they pastoralists? Are they farmers, uh, gatherers, hunters? This all relates to giving analogous equivalent protection to these groups within the African uh, uh, context so that we can speak of indigenous people's rights also in Africa without then uh, discussing who was first in a particular part of Africa. The same development we see in the policy documents of the World Bank and other international financial institutions where focus has shifted from being first to vulnerability. Vulnerability in relation to modernization. So where we have, for instance, mega projects, infrastructure projects of highway construction, or electricity grid or hydroelectrical power plants. The process starts by identifying, do we have indigenous groups that would be affected? Would there be forced population transfers? And the financial institutions do ask the question who was first, but that's not a decisive question. They apply a palette of different criteria where vulnerability has become more important than the order of arrival. Hence, many governments have resorted to pragmatic solutions, and this is fine. There are many strong reasons of equality to extend the indigenous people's protections to other groups. What I want to emphasize here today is that this idea of being generous and extending indigenous people's rights protections to others than truly indigenous does not entail any right for a government to impose such generous extension upon indigenous peoples themselves. Governments have no right to say, well, because these people are similarly situated, they are also Maya or Chechua or Aymara or Mapuche. It's for the groups themselves to define themselves, define the rules of their membership, define their identity on basis of their customs and tradition. And this is what indigenous self-determination means, the internal aspect of it. If governments want to be generous, they ask, what other groups are there? How can we help them? Should we recognize them as indigenous or should we use some other legal category? Uh, next slide, please. Now I get to ILO Convention 169. There's the scope of application provision in Article 1. It's not actually a definition. It's a scope of application provision which says to which groups the convention applies. And as you see, it's collective in nature. It first uh, gives the criteria for tribal peoples and then the criteria for indigenous peoples where the emphasis is on being first. Peoples who are regarded as indigenous on account of their descent from the populations which inhabited the country 
or a geographical region to which the country belongs at the time of conquest, conquest or colonization or the establishment of present state boundaries, and who retain some of their own social, economic, cultural and political institutions. This is fully in line in the uh, conceptual characterization I presented earlier. It's collective in nature. It speaks about culture, it speaks about way of life and being first in relation to the currently dominant population. It's not about which individuals were first, even between indigenous groups themselves. There's a relational approach. Who is indigenous in relation to the currently dominant population and how they derive their way of life and culture from the situation that preceded the drawing of current uh, state borders. And as you see, paragraph two includes a self-identification provision, which is also collective in nature. Self-identification as indigenous or tribal shall be regarded as a fundamental criterion for determining the groups to which the provisions of this convention apply. There's nothing in ILO Convention 169 that would define who is a member of indigenous peoples. ILO Convention 169 is from 1989, when states had not yet accepted the recognition of indigenous peoples' right of self-determination. So the word self-determination doesn't appear in ILO 169, but the content of self-determination is reflected in many provisions. Intentionally, uh, the relationship between the individual and the community, the indigenous community, are not regulated through ILO, uh, through states which adopted the treaty, but it's left to practice under the convention as it emerges. Together with the ILO, states identify the groups which fall under Article 1, and then ILO starts to monitor a state's compliance with the substantive provisions of the convention. We will have today Dr. Martin Oelts from the ILO, who will address ILO Convention 169 and its Article 1 as to how ILO approaches indigenous peoples. But I want to emphasize that the notion of descent in this provision means ethnicity, means culture, means way of life. It is not about one individual living today being able to identify one ancestor 1762, 250 years ago, who would have been indigenous. That's not what the approach to indigenous peoples is anywhere or in ILO Convention 169. Today, an individual living today has 250 years ago, 1000 ancestors, and it would be unthinkable that any one of us can claim to be indigenous simply on account of the fact that there might have been one of our ancestors uh, 250 years ago who had an indigenous way of life and belonged to an indigenous group. It is the group that descends to cultures and communities that may have maintained and developed the traditions in question in close interaction with the natural environment. Next slide, please. Another issue of contention is what did the Human Rights Committee actually say in its uh, two final views uh, in relation to Finland in the cases of Tina Sanila Aikio against Finland and Klemetti Näkkälärvi and others against Finland. I was counsel to Tina Sanila Aikio whose complaint was submitted through a decision by, of the executive board of the Sami parliament. So I acted as lawyer to the Sami parliament in their case at the Human Rights Committee. There's been a lot of misinformation and I would say even intentional disinformation as to what the Human Rights Committee said, what the procedure was. I want to emphasize that in, as in any human rights complaint procedure, 
there are always two parties to a case. There's the complainant, who is an individual or a group of individuals, and then there's the respondent state. And the question is, did the state violate the rights of the complainant under the treaty in question? There are no other parties in the issue to be resolved in an adjudicatory procedure. The two parties are heard equally, and they are able to comment each other's submissions. And this is exactly the way how these cases were dealt with as well. Luckily, we have with us today the chairperson of the Human Rights Committee, Professor Patharsis, who will uh, address the approach of the Human Rights Committee in the issue and also procedurally. Uh, this is what the Human Rights Committee said. It's a quote from the Sanila Aikyo case. And as lawyer, I believe and I assert this is exactly correct. The Supreme Administrative Court from 2011 onwards departed from the consensual interpretation of Section 3 of the Sami Parliament Act. What's meant here? It's a reference to the Supreme Administrative Court ruling from 1999, number 55, where the Supreme Administrative Court took a sensible approach uh, to the so-called LAP criterion, which is uh, item two under section three, saying it cannot be extended how far back uh, in history as anybody can imagine. There must be a temporal limit where a person can claim membership in the Sami community simply by having an ancestor who has been registered by the state into the so-called LAP registers earlier. This is in line with the main criterion, the linguistic criterion, and also in the preparatory works of the Act. It's true that in the parliamentary consideration, the Sami were disappointed and one could say cheated in the sense that what had been promised to the Sami, the year 1875 as a borderline, was removed from the explanations so that the clause only refers to lap registers. But it is not true that this would have meant that there wouldn't be any temporal limit. It remained a matter of interpretation and until 2011, the Sami and the Supreme Administrative Court interpreted in the same way how far back one can extend the claim for Sami-ness through uh, old land or taxation registers referred to in the LAP criterion. This ended in 2011. Next, the Human Rights Committee says in its rulings 2011 and then on a massive scale in 2015, the Supreme Ministry Court failed to require satisfaction of at least one of the objective criteria in the majority of cases, instead applying an overall consideration. This is exactly correct. We submitted to the Human Rights Committee the uh, precedent rulings by the court itself, where clearly the court says old registers where a person has been entered as a lab do not alone meet the requirement of Section 3, Item 2. Instead, the court will apply its overall consideration. So the rulings are clear. The person did not meet in the view of the court, still any of the objective criteria, but were adopted through uh, overall consideration by the court itself. This was not every one of the 97 cases, it was in the majority of cases. And the Supreme Administrative Court itself has calculated they were about two thirds of the cases, so more than 60 cases. Further, the committee says, and examining whether a person's own opinion about considering themselves as Sami was strong. This is also exactly correct. The uh, clause, Section 3, has a self-identification uh, clause in the chapeau. But the Supreme Administrative Court started to measure how strong is one's self-identification. And of course, the Supreme Administrative Court is not an expert on Sami cultures, traditions, livelihoods. It, it, it took, looked at the prima facie uh, face value of what is submitted by a person. They don't have a single Sami member and they didn't rely on any external Sami expertise. 
to determine what would be strong identification by a person herself. They use this as a main avenue to do that overall consideration. So they had uh, some elements related to the objective criteria and then their own sense of self, uh, strong self-identification, which was decisive in a majority of the cases. This operation, departing from an earlier accepted interpretation of the law in the view of the Human Rights Committee, was a violation of the ICCPR, a violation of a key dimension of Sami self-determination. Basically, the Sami, the electoral board and the uh, executive board of the Sami parliament maintain the interpretation of the law that had been there since the adoption of the law in 1994 through several consecutive elections. They applied the law as it stood and from 2011, the Supreme Administrative Court pulled the carpet under their legs and started to apply the law in a very different way. I won't stop here. Um, I, I, those who know my uh, uh, character know that I am a, a very outspoken person and I enjoy to do it in public rather than in private. May I have the next slide? This is the chronology of the inconsistencies of the Supreme Administrative Court. In 1999, they still decided that the criterion of having a single ancestor registered as a lab cannot be applied further back than the mind criterion of language, and explicitly not as far back as to 1762, which I used already earlier as an example. Then the change happened in 2011 and was consolidated through a massive number of cases in 2015, where the court says having a single ancestor registered as a lab does still not meet the objective criterion of the law, but the court may apply its own overall consideration as to whether the person's self-identification as Sami is strong. This means that identical cases were decided differently, resulting in arbitrariness and confusion and lack of guidance for the electoral board of the Sami parliament, how it should actually apply the law. Sister and brother could be treated differently. Uh, from one election to the next, the outcome changed for one of the same person, etc. We came to a situation of uh, discriminatory differences in treatment in identical cases and identical treatment of very different cases through the court's overall consideration, which is not much more than uh, tossing the coin. This is not the worst part of the story. In 2019, after the Human Rights Committee views, the Supreme Administrative Court started to say, we never said that about overall consideration. Actually, a single ancestor marked in the registers as a lab or anecdotal evidence of somebody speaking Sami do meet the objective criteria. And only then when one objective criteria is met, we will apply our own overall consideration. It's fine or at least tolerable that the court changes its view, its interpretation. But it's not fine that the court, the highest court in the country in these matters, retroactively tries to explain away what it actually decided. We sent to the Human Rights Committee their decisions and the Human Rights Committee considered and understood them cor correctly. But when the Human Rights Committee views were uh, released on 1st of February 2019, the president of the Supreme Administrative Court immediately publicly said that the committee had misunderstood something. And from there, the uh, Supreme Administrative Court started to revise its own earlier judgments. The next turn is a little bit of light in the end of the tunnel. Now in 2021, the Supreme Administrative Court in April decided many dozens of cases from 2019. Such it is a bit absurd that two and a half years 
uh, sorry, one and a half year after the elections, the court considers who is allowed to be entered into the electoral role of 2019 elections. Many a lawyer would say that the case had become moot when the Supreme Administrative Court hadn't dealt with the appeals before the elections ended. But now the court said, we'll deal with these one and a half years after the fact, and they rejected a great number of appeals by referring to the Human Rights Committee views and by saying, now we need to be more strict in the application of the objective criteria. If you read those rulings carefully, uh, they preserve the right to decide otherwise in individual cases. But in a great number of cases, they followed a more strict approach and, and made a kind of a corrective move in respect of uh, coming closer to the wording of the statute and hence complying with the Human Rights Committee views. This is not the only thing, however, what was decided. In a couple of dozen cases, the court still ordered the inclusion of the person in the electoral role. And it was exactly cases where the same court had already earlier decided a case by the same person or a parent. So basically the court says, if we have decided something, it has become, it has legal force and preclusive effect to future cases. So the court is saying, whatever the law is and how it is now understood, we uh, insist that we determine person by person whether a person belongs to the electoral role of the Sami parliament. And they didn't decide it in respect of the 2019 electoral role, what the case considered, what the appeal to the court considered. They decided that in 2023, the person must be entered into the electoral role. As lawyer, I don't understand this. That electoral role doesn't exist. There's a procedure for it. You apply to be entered. The electoral board decides you have a right of complaint and the electoral board examines your case. Then ultimately you may have a right to appeal to a court. But even then the Sami must be heard in the case. It cannot be acceptable that the court decides as first instance on behalf of the Sami themselves who belongs to the 2023 electoral vote. All this speaks uh, in favor of the necessity of fixing the law. We have seen through this, these twists and turns at the Supreme Administrative Court that the judicial body in question is not able uh, to correct its course. We have come to a complete mess where nobody is happy with the outcome. If you read, for instance, Dr. Jonas' dissenting opinion, he's not happy with what, where the Supreme Court, Supreme Administrative Court has ended. He also wants a change, but it doesn't want the change as proposed by the Drafting Commission. Next slide, please. Um, we will have with us uh, Martin Kierum, who was a member of the Racial Discrimination Committee in 2003, when the co committee said that Finland should consider giving more weight to individual uh, self-identification as Sami. This is a standard position of the Racial Discrimination Committee that they have emphasized that membership in a minority is a decision for the individual himself, herself. And one can very well understand that this comes from the uh, dreadful history of fascism and Nazism, where the state decided who is a Jew or who is a Roma with uh, deadly consequences. Individuals decide whether they want to identify with a group or not. But what is often overlooked in the Finnish debate is that the standard position of the Committee Against Racial Discrimination includes the clause if no justification exists to the contrary. So there is nothing in the actual position of the Racial Discrimination Committee which would say the group has no role. And uh, subsequent work by the Racial Discrimination Committee in respect of indigenous people specifically has emphasized that because they are self-governing peoples with internal self-determination, they must have a say as to membership in the group. In a group. I leave it to Morten Kierum who will be hearing later on today.
Next slide, please. The drafting commission can be criticized for not giving sufficient attention to the Council of Europe Framework Convention on National Minorities. There are references uh, to this convention and to the uh, monitoring process in respect of the of the uh, uh, FPIC part of the uh, amendment proposal, free prior informed consent, but on the, not in the membership part. I don't think it's a substantive omission in the sense that what the advisory committee of experts and what the committee of ministers have said to Finland is very much in line with what the drafting commission proposes. On the left here, we have the summarized version of uh, the advisory committee's report from the minister, committee of ministers resolution where they urge Finland to develop together with the Sami a commonly recognized system for registration on the electoral road that strikes an adequate balance between the interests of the community in preserving its structures of self-government go governance on the one hand and the principle of free self-identification on the other. This process should be inclusive and strive to reach an agreement on criteria for registration of the electoral role, on an appeals mechanism, on the interpretation of these criteria, and on a longer time frame for decision making on applications. Every one of these elements have been carefully considered by the drafting commission and the proposal, in my assessment, meets uh, the wishes of the advisory committee and the committee of ministers. I don't think one could imagine a better way of complying also with these recommendations from the Council of Europe system. I do want to emphasize that uh, the approach of national minorities is old fashioned and very state centered in relation in comparison with the modern regime of indigenous people's rights. The treaty uh, represents a different worldview than the current approach to indigenous peoples and their rights as self-determining peoples. But nevertheless, the outcome is fine. And I do think that the drafting commission proposal complies with it, provided that the part related to the inclusive process remains. Every member of the Sami parliament has a role in deciding whether the Sami parliament accepts the drafting commission proposal. The official consideration is still pending. This was the case for, and I briefly will now present the case against. May I have the next slide? Here is Dr. Jonas reading of ILO Convention 169. According to Article 1 of the Convention, an indigenous people means those persons who descend from the population that inhabited the area, etc. This is not what ILO Convention says. I'm quoting it at the bottom and I'm not engaging here a discussion with Yona. I'm just having a quote from his dissenting opinion and a quote from the ILO Convention. It's important uh, that Yona uh, in his explanation refers to certain internal waves within the Sami when they have settled in the areas currently inhabited by the Sami and draws a distinction between those who lived in the area in the 17th and 18th century and those who uh, as nomadic Sami moved changed location in the 19th century so in the 1800s, and he uses the notion migrants. The majority of these migrants were reindeer herding Sami of Norway. The notion of indigenous peoples deals with the Sami as indigenous, even when they were nomadic. It was a way of life of the Sami that they moved between the now Norwegian coasts at the Arctic Ocean and the lowlands of Finland, and that does not make them one bit less indigenous in the area. And ILO Convention 169 explicitly is about groups that have inhabited an area which is larger than a state or extends across state borders. There's nothing in the migration patterns, the nomadic migration patterns that diminishes the indigenous of any group of the Sami. And if we take the issue of 
continuity uh, of a culture. There is no joint Sami identity without recognizing the real and main forms of life of the Sami community as they today live. Indigenousness is, is not about looking at practices of groups within a group which may have disappeared or have lost their tradition. Indigenousness is looking at the culture that lives and thrives today and how it is transmitted into the future. The Sami are a very rich indigenous people who have many traditions and many backgrounds. And uh, the Finnish Sami have their identity, which combines elements of northern Sami, is called Sami and Indian Sami cultures. And there's been a good rotation and good collaboration between the different groups within the Sami parliament, even if one of the groups is bigger than the others. I must say here that I was very disheartened by reading a blog post by Jouni Kitti. Jouni Kitti is a senior member of the Sami community and a person who has made a long career in the Finnish state administration as a voice for the Sami and also as a civil servant for the Finnish government. He writes in a recent blog post about uh, tension or even conflict between the Northern Sami and the Inari Sami and says the basic idea of the national battle by the Inari Sami has always been a view that the Northern Sami who lead the Sami parliament are a foreign occupier. No, they are not a foreign occupier. They are part of the indigenous nation which lives in four countries and have de decided to identify themselves as, a, as one people living in four current countries and speaking multiple Sami languages. It is for them uh, to exercise their internal self-determination and speak to the mainstream society with a voice. Next slide, please. This is uh, Dr. Jonas' interpretation of the Finnish constitution according to section 17, subsection 3 of the constitution. A Sami means persons who belong to an indigenous people. It is of course clear that also the definition of a Sami must include a criterion concerning an indigenous people. A person considered to be a Sami was required to be descended from the original population of the area. This is an effort to use the notion of descent in ILO Convention 169 to relate to individual genetic traits who can prove one ancestor several hundred years ago is more indigenous than, for instance, the Northern Sami, who Yohayona claims came in the 1800s into the area. Of course, this is not what the Constitution says. I have again included the authentic quote of the Constitution. It is about recognition of the Sami as an indigenous people and their right to develop their language and culture. It says nothing about who is a Sami and there is no conceptual definition of indigenousness that would give rise to trying to define which persons can have a claim of being indigenous. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the position of uh, Dr. Riona in relation to the racial discrimination convention. Uh, the quote is a bit long, but basically he's saying that the 2012 and 2017 concluding observations by the Racial Discrimination Committee in the consideration of Finland's report uh, do not matter because the Racial Discrimination Committee has stopped interpreting the Racial Discrimination Convention and is now applying the UN Declaration Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is not correct. Of course, the Racial Discrimination Convention applies the Racial Discrimination Convention and takes into account other international instruments. And they have been uh, uh, informed and enriched by the modern development of indigenous people's rights. But still, it is about what the Racial Discrimination Convention says and how it is interpreted. And we go back to the 1990 general recommendations by the same committee, which says self-identification by an individual 
is, is decisive, provided there are no objective reasons to the contrary. We note that the year 1762 again appears here and Jana is claiming that Serge says that anyone who can identify an ancestor who in 1762, 250 years ago, was entered to the land register as a lap is today a Sami. I find it unthinkable that this would be a correct legal position. Thank you. I have presented the case for and against. Uh, and I wanted to present Dr. Jonas' quotes as authentic in order to be clear that I'm not making it up, but I couldn't avoid it. I could not avoid adding some comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Marte Treinin, and thanks everyone who was speaking at the beginning of our event. Uh, before the coffee break that starts at quarter past, I think we have um, time for one question at least. Let's see. Uh, and Mikko Vartijainen has been asking in the chat a question. And, and before I read that to uh, Martin and you have a chance to respond, uh, I say that uh, the audience is making good use of the chat. Thank you for that. That's very useful and please uh, keep writing comments and you can also add questions as they come up. Uh, but I do remind you that please keep the comments appropriate uh, and respectful. Um, unless that happens, we might have to close the chat, but we obviously don't want to do this because uh, this is a, an open discussion. So let's let's keep them appropriate. Uh, but there is a question from Mikko Vartijainen uh, to Martin Scheinin, and the question is, you wrote on page four, this misconstruction cannot be an honest error, but constitutes a deliberate effort to distort facts and law. What do you mean? It, it is uh, about the use of the ILA Convention to distort the understanding of the Constitution. Uh, it is a intentional misrepresentation of the constitution to say that Finland would have adopted a constitutional definition of who is an indigenous individual. And that definition would be based on genetic lineage from any single ancestor who might have belonged to the first recorded inhabitants of a particular place. This is what I'm saying. And I, I stand behind this position that nobody who has studied the preparatory works of the constitution now section 17, could claim this. It's simply about recognition of the Sami as an indigenous people. And uh, by the way, I was one of the secretaries of the drafting commission of that uh, uh, fundamental rights uh, chapter of the Finnish constitution in 1989 to 1992. So I was there when the provision was drafted and there, there was no intention, no effort to define who is a Sami. Every lawyer, every lawyer knows that. Every lawyer would look at the preparatory works and, and the government bill is very clear. Thank you, Martin. Uh, then there are some lengthy comments uh, and questions above. A uh, question by Retta Toivonen seems to um, be directed to the Human Rights Committee, so maybe we'll take that later. Um, but since we have about five minutes, uh, Maybe, Martin, you want to address a comment slash question by Irja Seuriarvikari uh, at the beginning of the chat, where she says that as a member of the Sami parliament in Finland, I would like to comment to Martin Scheinin that, um, that I, as well as other Sami parliament members, were invited to this seminar only when the program was already set. Uh, that seems to imply a question about the setup of the seminar that you mentioned at the beginning. Would you like to comment this? Yes, uh, this event was organized as an assessment seminar focused on uh, input by international experts. In addition, we have explicitly a slot for hearing all members of the Sami parliament, uh, all MPs, members of the Finnish parliament elected from the electoral district of Lapland, as well as all members of the drafting commission. 
So we have a slot for them, but we haven't named them as individuals because we are naming individual experts who are externals to the process. So there is no exclusion or anything, and every single member of the Sami parliament was invited. Thank you, Martin. Uh, session two, the presentations by the international panel will be started by Dr. Martin Oelts. And without further ado, I'll give you the floor and your topic is what does Article 1 of ILO Convention 169 entail? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, good morning, uh, participants at this international uh, workshop. Uh, it is a really a great pleasure and honor to, to be with you and to uh, share a few thoughts about uh, Article uh, 1 of Convention 169. Um, uh, so this is, of course, a very uh, important article of the Convention, and I hope uh, what we, we will be able to share will be useful um, for the discussions in the workshop, but also for the uh, continuing dialogue on these issues that is taking place uh, in Finland. Um, I really thank the organizers for giving us this uh, opportunity to be with you today. Um, the, my remarks today will mainly focus on um, paragraphs one and two of Article one, and I, I will have a look at the, at the terms of these provisions and will also draw on some aspects of the drafting history uh, to place them in, in the context. Uh, um, uh, and then I, uh, and towards the end of my presentation, I will also look at a couple of examples how the ILO in its institutional practice has relied on and has understood uh, uh, these articles and, and is using these, are these provisions of Article 1. Um, I should also say that uh, I'm making these remarks as an ILO official uh, who is uh, uh, habilitated to, to, to give advice on these matters, but uh, these remarks are not in the strict sense a formal opinion of the ILO uh, on the interpretation of the Convention or the co compatibility of the amendments uh, that are being looked at with the Convention, uh, since we have very specific dedicated ILO channels and procedures for doing so. So interested parties can, can look at those channels if, if there is a need for that, but nevertheless, uh, uh, these remarks are made, uh, you know, uh, from from the ILO uh, in my capacity as an, uh, an ILO staff. You know that um, um, uh, 24 member states of the ILO uh, have ratified Convention 169. Um, the latest ratification is that of Germany um, uh, from 22 June 2021. And we have now five countries in Europe that have ratified the Convention, which is uh, very good news. Uh, which is also um, uh, seen as a as a increasing recognition and strengthening of international law on indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, Latin America remains the region where the convention is most widely ratified, of course, and uh, and 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 uh, hence the experiences from there are also uh, very very relevant. Now, uh, Article uh, One, along with other provisions of the convention, have gain broader relevance uh, beyond the ratifying countries. And this is so because uh, Convention 169, while being part of an evolving process of emergence of international law on the rights of indigenous peoples, remains the only international treaty that is currently open for ratification that is specifically and expressly dedicated to indigenous peoples' rights. And as such, the Convention, convention continues to be of use and of influence in international and national debates, processes, drafting of new instruments, uh, but also national practice, including judicial decisions. Uh, and this is the case also, as I said, in, in non-ratifying uh, countries. Now, um, let me move to uh, making uh, some remarks on Article uh, 1 then. Uh, Many ILO conventions and, uh, have provisions up front, you know, in the beginning on scope and definitions, and Convention 169 is no exception here. Um, the drafting history of Convention 169, and I would say that uh, this drafting history includes actually Convention 107, which is the older convention of the ILO and the preparation of that older convention. Uh, and this is so because the basic architecture of Article 1 of 169 is actually based on Article 1 of Convention 107, uh, which was adopted in 1957. And that drafting history shows that the drafters were fully aware of the difficulties of 
coming up with a definition of indigenous peoples for the purpose of an international instrument that would do justice to the great diversity of situations around the world. And uh, a, a very interesting quote I found is uh, a government representative from New Zealand doubted in 1956 uh, in the International Labour Conference uh, saying that he was doubting that whether a single definition of the word indigenous would satisfy more than a handful of people. So this this shows the kind of desperateness that was there, you know, in the beginning of international discussions on, on indigenous peoples um, uh, in terms of international standards. And it shows also how far we have come actually uh, in this development, having actually now quite uh, an interesting, uh, you know, uh, we came to a quite of a, um, a pragmatic and, and 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 functional and useful understanding of, of what are the elements of indigenous peoples uh, and, and indigenous in international law. So uh, this is just a, a flashback. Despite the challenges in, in 1957, agreements was reached in con for con purpose of Convention 107 to include actually a set of criteria that describe the groups that the instrument was meant to cover rather than attempting uh, to draw up a legal definition of indigenous peoples. Um, so this wording um, uh, um, that was referred to this morning uh, about uh, that indigenousness is, is, is defined on account of descent from historic population. Um, uh, so th this, uh, this wording is already included in Convention uh, 107 and has with some changes um, uh, then uh, found its way into Convention uh, 169. And um, uh, so Article 169 of Convention 169 is, is similar than the older one, but it has very, very significant and fundamental substantive changes. And, and I want it, and this is very important to understand uh, uh, Convention 169, Article 1, uh, this, that, as, as it stands today. Um, uh, now, instead of apply, uh, applying to the uh, saying that the convention applies to members of tribal or semi tribal populations, with this was 107, the new convention uh, says art in Article 1 that the convention applies to peoples. Um, then also, the, the new convention no longer refers to less advanced conditions of those groups, but um, uh, to, to the conditions that distinguish them from other parts of the national population as a, as a collective. And um, here it's very clear and it's important to, uh, to, to also recall that the very purpose of the revision was actually to overcome uh, the assimilist approach that, that was embodied in Convention 169, which had the idea, basically the underlying idea, to look at indigenous um, uh, populations uh, in terms of individual members of these populations and, and achieve a, 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 an integration in mainstream societies of these uh, um, of individuals, of indigenous persons into society, so basically a dissolution of, of peoples uh, in, in that sense. Um, in, the, in the same vein, uh, in paragraph 1b of Convention 169, uh, uh, wording suggesting backwardness of indigenous institutions have been removed, and now we have this reference to um, the retention of some or all of their own social, economic, cultural, and political institutions. Uh, and finally, uh, and that is really the watershed here, uh, in addition to shifting from members of populations to peoples, the wording on descent from historic populations uh, in parallel was also completed by a new reference um, uh, to the establishment of the present state boundaries. And this speaks again to the fact that uh, um, this is broader uh, than only um, prior to uh, colonization or, uh, um, or, or conquest. And, um, and it's not necessarily about only a single state, but also a geographic um, uh, region. Uh, and then in Article 1.2, of course, that is very well known, and it is also part of that crucial paradigm shift, is the insertion of the principle of self-identification in Article 1, Paragraph 2 of Convention 169. Um, and here we, um, uh, we, from these changes, we can really uh, see that uh, uh, this shift from members to peoples and uh, in combination with self-identification, that uh, Convention 169, the overall focus is really the recognition of indigenous tribal peoples as collective uh, with a right to maintain and further develop their identities, economies and institutions as peoples. And based on this, one can conclude that the notion of descent in Article 11b is used to denote historic continuity of a people as a whole for the purpose of identifying 
peoples uh, covered by the convention, rather than for the purpose of determining whether or not an individual belongs uh, to a given people um, uh, based on genealogy. Now, um, Convention 169 uh, clearly also does not have any provision similar to Article 33 of the UN Declaration, uh, where we see uh, where we have more have a specific uh, provision recognizing the right of indigenous peoples to determine their own membership and the structure and membership of their institutions. Uh, however, the ILO supervisory bodies uh, did state that while uh, Convention 169 does not impose a model of what a representative institution should involve. The important thing is that they should be the result of a process carried out by the indigenous peoples themselves. Now, uh, while the formulation of Article 1 does not mention any specific actions to be taken by the ratifying state, uh, it has been understood as requiring uh, those states to determine the peoples they consider to be covered. This is important actually uh, for ensuring that the totality of the provisions of the convention apply to degree to all the groups that fall within the criteria set out in the convention. The identification of peoples for the purpose of the convention requires an examination of the conditions, social, cultural, economic, the customs and traditions and institutions uh, of these peoples as collectives. And for this is it important to know also where the people live, uh, what's their uh, demographic uh, and social and economic and cultural indicators, etc. Um, and this uh, this uh, idea of, of uh, Article 1 is also borne out by the report form that was adopted by the ILO governing body for the purpose of reporting to the ILO, where we have uh, specific questions listed that states must respond to in regard to Article 1 when they report. And this is uh, in, in, in these questions, I will not read them fully out, but there is one question that asks the people, asks the government to, to say what are the groups that in its view, uh, and that's very important, in its view it's not an absolute determination, because there is also the principle of self-determination, fall within the scope of the convention and, and, and which are meant to be covered by the measures taken. Um, and uh, there is also questions about uh, the size of the group and, and where this group lives. Um, and this is uh, a means to ensure that the measures that, that the ILO has a way of seeing whether the measures taken are uh, appropriate uh, uh, with regard to securing the application. And there is also a specific question about um, the how the principle of self-identification is, is applied. Um, now, I will uh, give a few examples only of how the supervisory bodies have applied or used or relied upon Article 1. Um, maybe one example from the region is, uh, is Norway, of course. Um, in its first report on the application of the Convention uh, to the ILO, Norway reported that the Sami had been identified as indigenous uh, um, and uh, uh, and following a question um, and, and uh, regarding the coverage of the Sami as an indigenous people under convention, uh, the, the, the government further clarified how the principle of self-determination had been applied to arrive at that determination. Um, that was a direct request to the government. Uh, this exchange can be also read, of course, in this in the comments that are published uh, that the, uh, of the committee of experts. Um, now, in another example is uh, with regard to Peru. Uh, the Committee of Experts engaged into a very long dialogue about national laws and policies that, ref that did not refer to peoples, but rather to communities. And um, it was not very clear uh, uh, because there was inconsistency about different communities across laws and it was not clear um, to which communities the, convent, the, the government uh, wanted to apply this convention. Uh, and hence, uh, the, for, to, to, to have this legal insecurity um, removed, um, the, the, dialogue, uh, the dialogue went on and eventually the government came up with a frame, draft framework act on indigenous or original peoples of Peru, which had, a, had, um, which had the, the, the objective to uh, defining national le legislation um, uh, which groups are covered and to harmonize uh, uh, terminology with a view to uh, improve uh, legal security so those who enjoy these rights uh, can also have uh, the rights protected. Um, so that that was very interesting in the sense that um, uh, so Article 1 was again seen here in this context as a provision that that was meant to help clarity which which groups or which peoples are covered um, and to, to come to a situation 
Uh, this is particular when you have a multitude of different peoples in one country that it is clear to who, who the convention applies um, uh, and to whom it doesn't apply. No? Um, a final example, um, uh, this is also somewhat related. Um, uh, in uh, Article 24 representation in respect of Denmark relating Greenland, um, the committee that examined this, this representation, which is a complaint, um, uh, discussed the issue um, um, uh, um, regarding um, whether a, a community within the Danish indigenous uh, uh, population, uh, sorry, the Greenlandic uh, indigenous population, whether a community within them could could claim to be a people, no? And and they they uh, um, because this was about a grievance a specific community had actually against uh, get against some measures. Um, uh, that were taken by the Greenlandic government. Um, so in, in this in this context, uh, the, the committee said, while self-identification is a fundamental criterion for defining the groups to which the convention shall apply, this relates specifically to self-identification as indigenous or tribal and not necessarily to a feeling that those concerned are a people different from the other members of the indigenous or tribal population of the country. Uh, which together may form a people. So this is uh, this is um, uh, maybe another thing that can be looked at and studied, uh, to, you know, and this, which is a kind of underpinning that Article One is about identification of uh, of peoples as a whole rather than individual membership uh, uh, to that to that people. Now um, uh, I will cut uh, short uh, a little bit. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that the ILO overall in its work, in addition to the cyber, uh, what the supervisory bodies say, um, uh, has taken a rather a pragmatic approach when it comes to the issue of historic continuity and the question of who was there first. Uh, in this regard, I think it's very interesting to read what in the 2003 manual on the convention, uh, what was stated there and I'm reading a quote from there. Uh, I quote, the ILO focuses on the present day situation, uh, though historical continuity is important too. Uh, the challenge is how to improve the living and working conditions of indigenous and tribal peoples so they can continue to exist as a distinct people um, uh, if they wish to do so, uh, end of quote. And this is a very reflective also that, that this idea of who was there first uh, is is not so much something that is pursued, uh, and is also can, we can find very little about this in in the work of the supervisory bodies. I conclude. Uh, let me summarize a few considerations regarding Article One, and uh, I hope that this will be useful for the discussions today um, and and for future discussions uh, in Finland and uh, on on these topics. Um, Article One of Convention One Six Nine. Uh, um, uh, is, has the purpose of providing a basis for the identification or determination of groups in respect to which the ratifying state has an obligation under international law to take measures in good faith in order to give effect to the provisions of the convention. Uh, the notion of dissent in Article 11b of the convention denotes the collective historic continuity of a group from peoples that were present uh, before colonization, con conquest, or the establishment of the boundaries of the state. Uh, Article uh, uh, 1 does not uh, establish norms or rules uh, uh, regarding the acceptance or non-acceptance of people as belonging to an indigenous or tribal people, and it uh, it is a combination of objective and subjective criteria, of course the subjective criteria being uh, the principle of, of uh, self-determination. While states are required to make a determination for the purpose of uh, giving effect to the convention and reporting to the ILO, uh, it's also important to say that the rights under the convention exist uh, irrespective of such a de uh, determination. And in many cases, actually, uh, the groups that are covered by a convention grow over time. In many countries, it's like this because new new peoples are actually recognized or disco even discovered uh, uh, or Become to be known, and so this is uh, a dynamic uh, thing, and, and 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 the rights under the convention exist irrespective of, of official recognition um, and irrespective of how, how the groups are referred to. Uh, and finally, uh, the supervisory bodies uh, frequently free, uh, free, uh, frequently provide guidance to the states parties uh, on the identification on the peoples covered. Um, but they have so far never stepped in and sort of imposed a decision on whether or not a certain group should be considered as indigenous and hence covered under the convention. 
Um, so this is something where there has, uh, they have exercised some restraint and of course the, the nature of the supervisory bodies, which are not an international court, also impose some, in, uh, some limitations uh, to that. You know? However, when problems and issues related to identification have been brought before the supervisory bodies, those have always encouraged the parties involved to continue the dialogue on these issues, to explore further and to find solutions. Uh, with this, I would like to, to end my remarks and would like to thank you again and, and uh, pass back the, 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 the camera and the microphone to our chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Martin Oelts. Uh, we have one question for you and you indeed have time for that. So uh, I'll read it here from the chat. We have a question from um, Ursa Neumann from the Ministry of Justice uh, and you might, uh, Dr. Oelts, also able, be able to see it there, but I'll read it aloud anyway. The Deputy Parliamentary Ombudsman encouraged us to assess whether removing the definition of Sami from the Act on the Sami Parliament might make it more difficult to ratify the ILO Convention in Finland, that is. If I understand you correctly, the important thing is to identify the indigenous peoples covered by the Convention, not to have a definition on who belongs to the people in question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, I think it's very interesting also um, uh, the, the, this Peru example that I've mentioned is also is hinting a li little bit at the approach of the ILO. And also, the, the, the supervisory bodies have said that, um, that uh, what is important to understand which group is recognized as a people, uh, that is the main thing then to, to see what is, makes it effective. No? When, uh, uh, the, and the other thing is uh, then the supervisory bodies are also in, in the ILO is interested that measures are taken to understand what what are the actual conditions, you know, uh, like for instance, access to employment, access to uh, benefits, access to you know recognition of rights in practice, how how this works and how this can be assessed, and how, for instance, the socio-economic situation is evolving. So so that is that is that is at the collective level. Uh, this does not exclude that some countries decide um, to actually enshrine in the national law. Some somehow a definition, um, but uh, that is not uh, that is not uh, uh, I, you know that is not necessarily a requirement under the convention as long as it is clear who is covered you know by the convention and I, I would say particularly in a situation where there is one indigenous people uh, this this is a very clear case you now so that the. the and 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 uh, the ILO is not going into this, um, uh, and the convention doesn't go really into this um, uh, into this level um, of detail of of regulating individual membership or definition specific membership of a people. So there, and uh, we have we can also not forget that the, the convention provides for a high degree of flexibility. Uh, I mean, this is a general principle of international law. No? When there is no specific provision on this, then there is, you know, there is more in the, more, let's say, more flexibility for the state. And it's on this convention is also very, very important to find the approach that is makes things most workable for the national level to be effective. No, and uh, this is also in in 169. We have even a provision that makes that very clear. You know, uh, that speaks about the uh, the, the flexibility. Uh, and adjusting to the national circumstances. So I, I this would be a little bit, uh, um, I, I would not say that the, spontaneously, um, I would not say that the absence of a specific definition uh, would be a ratification obstacle. Thank you, Dr. Oelts. We will then have to move forward uh, with our tight schedule. Um, I saw a question there, uh, but um, Reta Toivonen, you will have a chance to speak later and, and perhaps we have time to answer also that question. But let's move forward and since it looks like we don't have Professor Megan Davis online yet, um, we will continue to the uh, presentation by Professor Fotini Basartis, uh, the chairperson of the Human Rights Committee. And uh, the topic is the position of the Human Rights Committee acting under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I hand the floor to Professor Pazartis. Thank you very much. And I do thank um, the university 
uh, of uh, Lapland for this invitation uh, and uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Scheinen. Uh, I am um, happy to be with you today in this um, um, expert uh, discussion on the issues relating to uh, the Sami uh, people of Finland. Uh, I have to say at the outset that I am currently the president of the Human Rights Committee, which has dealt with these issues, and I will uh, briefly present uh, how these issues has, have been dealt with. But of course, um, I am speaking here also in my, in my individual capacity as a member uh, of the Human Rights Committee. So uh, in my uh, brief presentation, what I want to do is just say, uh, give a few um, uh, insights on how the committee uh, has dealt with uh, these, uh, the situation of the Sami people uh, in accordance, of course, on and under the covenant on civil and political rights. Uh, so first of all, uh, as was said before, um, the committee has dealt with these issues in particularly um, recently uh, through the aspect of the right to vote uh, in elections to the Sami parliament in two uh, individual communications on the basis of its procedure of individual complaints under uh, optional protocol one uh, to which Finland is a party. So that means that individuals can bring a complaint uh, before the Human Rights Committee um, alleging a violation of uh, provisions of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. And the committee is acts as a judicial or quasi-judicial body, I should say, in this process, uh, examines the contentions by both the parties and uh, comes, arrives at its views, a decision, which are called the views, which uh, in legal terms are not binding, but uh, which the committee considers that uh, the state has a, a good faith obligation to abide by the uh, committee's uh, views. So this is one process. And then the other process, of course, that the committee has is in um, reviewing uh, the state party's reports on the way the um, co uh, covenant provisions are implemented within the state party uh, through a process uh, called a, a dialogue. And we recently conducted such a dialogue last March. It was a virtual and online dialogue. And the committee at that occasion also issued its concluding observations so that is also the, the other process which is used by the committee. Let me now turn first uh, very briefly. You have all of you are familiar with uh, the cases brought before the committee, but I would like just to say a few words on the context and how this was how these cases were um, were uh, adjudicated. Now, both cases uh, arose, in fact, out of issues of the elections and the eligibility to participate in the elections to the Sami parliament. Of course, underlying this is the issue of uh, the self-determination of the Sami people. But this was not directly an issue in the two uh, communications which were brought before the committee. Uh, the, the, the facts of the committee uh, the facts before the committee were that um, were brought on the one on in one case by the then president of the Sami Parliament of Finland, Ms. Tina Sanila Aikyo, uh, who brought one complaint, and uh, another complaint was brought by 25 members of the Sami um, people, um, both alleging violations of rights under the covenant. What had happened was that in September 2011, the Finnish Supreme Administrative Court had issued a decision departing from the accepted interpretation of Section 3 
of the Act uh, on the Sami Parliament, uh, which defines uh, who qualifies as a Sami person for the purposes of participation in the elections of the Sami Parliament, uh, and uh, uh, gives a priority also to uh, some objective criteria and to self-identification. In September 2015, this uh, court, the Supreme uh, Administrative Court, uh, granted the right to vote in the Sami Parliament elections to a number of those uh, uh, individuals who had been found in, in ineligible by the Sami Parliament. Um, and it had acknowledged that in the majority of the cases, uh, the persons whose applications were accepted did not meet uh, the, the objective criteria required by the act, but it proceeded into an overall c consideration. Uh, Professor Scheinen uh, gave you the most important um, uh, paragraph, which is paragraph 6.11 of the views uh, number 2668, 2015, which were issued, uh, as you know, in 2018. Now, the initial application was by Ms. Aki, uh, Akio, um, was uh, found uh, admissible by the committee because uh, the communication claimed violations of Ms. Akiko's individual rights. So this was uh, 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 um, found by, by the committee that the uh, both concerning Ms. Akiho and uh, the 25 other members of the Sami people, that uh, these communications were brought under their individual um, uh, concerning in, uh, violations of their individual rights. So in, in the uh, admissibility phase of the case of Ms. Akio, um, and in the case also, the other case also, the committee did reject the author's allegations under Article 1, which is the article on self-determination of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The committee reiterated its consistent view that an author as an individual cannot claim under the optional protocol to be a victim of a violation of the right of self-determination enshrined in Article 1 of the Covenant, which deals with right conferred uh, to peoples as such. However, the committee did emphasize, and that's what I wanted to say from the beginning, that while it could not make a finding, specific finding, on the alleged violation of Article 1, it did use Article 1 to interpret the rights, um, in, the rights protected under the covenant, and in particular, uh, in these cases, the rights under Article 25, which are electoral rights, and Article 27. Now, what were the committee's findings of briefly in both cases? The committee did find that Finland had violated the author's rights to political, effective political participation when its Supreme Administrative Court expanded the pool of eligible voters for the Sami Parliament by giving the right to vote to a number of individuals who the Sami parliament had found to be ineligible, thus adversely affecting the representative value of the Sami parliament. Uh, the, uh, with respect to Article 25 of our covenant, uh, which is the right to take part in public life, the committee explained that the objective and reasonable criteria must be applied to election structures. It found that in determining who would be considered Sami for the purposes of voting in the Sami parliament uh, elections, uh, the Finnish administrative court did not apply the required elements objectively and relied on the individual's own opinions, uh, a fact which impacted the right of the Sami people to effective representation in the Sami parliament. The committee referenced its general comment number 23, explaining that the rights of minorities need to be thought of as a means of pursuing the preservations of the rights of the community to enjoy its own culture and use its own language. And the committee also explained 
that the electoral process for the Sami parliament accordingly must ensure effective participation of those concerned in the internal self-determination process, which is necessary for the continued viability and the welfare of the indigenous community as a whole. So the committee found that the effective enjoyment of the right to internal self-determination requires that um, the uh, individuals forming part of the indigenous peoples must be afforded with the capacity uh, to define uh, the group membership. So based on these, um, uh, on these findings of the committee, uh, the committee uh, has ascertained that uh, Finland is now under an obligation to provide an effective remedy. And specifically, the Human Rights Committee has requested that a Finland review the Sami Parliament Act uh, to ensure that the voting eligibility criteria are defined in a way that respects the Sami people's right to internal self-determination in accordance with Article 25 and 27 of the, uh, of the covenant. So this is where um, we are at uh, concerning the these two decisions. Now, after this, uh, the, the two views were issued, the Supreme Administrative Court, by a decision in 2019, rejected the request by the Executive Board of the Sami Parliament, following the views of the committee, to annul its decisions of 26 November 2011 and 30 September 2015 concerning uh, the individuals who were in the uh, electoral um, in the electoral ro uh, role. So when uh, we are still waiting for the follow up, there is a follow up a procedure for the implementation of the committee's views, and we are awaiting to have a clearer picture. Um, for in order to issue um, our follow up to the implementation of the views. But I have to say that this issue was also discussed recently, as I stated before, uh, when in our uh, very recent uh, dialogue with uh, Finland uh, last uh, March. Uh, and in the concluding observations of this committee, uh, uh, the committee expressed uh, its concern that the decisions, these views, the two views of the committee have not yet been implemented. And if you see the concluding observations by the committee, uh, it is stated that on the contrary, the decisions of the Supreme Administrative Court of 5 July 2019, reinstating the 97 individuals to the electoral role that the Electoral Committee of the Sami Parliament had removed, appear to run counter to the views uh, of the uh, committee. So this is where we stand, and this is the position that the committee has um, reiterated in its concluding observations. Uh, let me just state to return to the, um, maybe to explain a little the procedure, the judicial or the quasi-judicial procedure of the committee. As I stated, the committee works on the basis of an individual complaint brought forth uh, when a state has accepted the optional um, a protocol one procedure, that of individual complaints. So a party brings forth an individual complaint. Uh, the state is then uh, present, the individual presents its views, presents its complaint. The state party then has afforded, of course, the possibility to um, respond to these uh, to the complaints and the claims by uh, the author or authors. And uh, then the author can return with remarks and the state again can return with remarks uh, to this to the individual's claim. So this is a an adversarial procedure. 
Most of it, of course, is conducted in uh, the context of the Human Rights Committee, is conducted in writing. Uh, so the, the positions both of the author or authors, the complainants, and the state a party against whom the complainants are forming a complaint is given the possibility to uh, express uh, um, its uh, opinions and its views on the basis and the foundation of the claims. So this is just to explain uh, that this is a, a procedure which uh, concerns the complainant or complainants on the one hand and the uh, state a party against which the complaint is directed on, on the other hand. So um, the, the committee first has to find, of course, that the claim uh, is brought by an individual who is a victim uh, uh, or claims to be a victim of the viola of violations of the covenant. This is what happened in this case. And I also have to add, in addition, that in specific, specifically in the Akiho um, uh, case, the um, this is procedural, but it has um, um, it has an importance in what we're discussing today, perhaps. Uh, the committee um, separated the admissibility from the uh, uh, the merit stage, and this ha uh, gave the opportunity to the uh, to the committee on the one hand to ask both parties to uh, respond to specific questions and concerns concerning the case, and thus to have a clearer overall picture once it came to deciding the merits of the case. So this is a procedural uh, uh, aspect which I just wanted to, uh, to also put forth to say that both uh, parties, if you wish, were given the opportunity uh, in writing, of course, to give uh, their position on the, the uh, on these cases. So this is where uh, we stand. I don't want to keep uh, you, maybe I've taken up too much of your time, but uh, this is what, uh, I mean, the case was about and what the, the committee decided, uh, perhaps. And also I did want to include the fact that we did have a constructive dialogue with the state party where these concerns were also raised. And um, we also, as you probably most of you know, uh, during these uh, state reporting procedures, uh, all interested uh, um, uh, 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 participants are given the opportunity to present uh, their um, submissions to the committee and that the committee takes note of all of these submissions. So I will stop here. Uh, this was the general picture. I hope I presented it in a uh, understandable way, uh, and I look forward to um, uh, hearing uh, generally what uh, uh, comments will be said during today's um, expert workshop. Thank you, Madam, very much. Thank you, Professor Pasartis, so much. Uh, and we have time for one question, and this comes from Marco Kikeri from University of Lapland. Uh, and the question is, dear Professor Pasartis, uh, could you explain a bit about the differences of CERD and UN committee approaches and differences in, in interpreting law. Uh, I am referring to the individual protection versus collective rights approach, the systematic approach to international law in general. Uh, and a brief answer would be appre uh, appreciated. Thank you. Yes, let me just state at the outset um, uh, in the reaction to this that, of course, both and all other human rights mechanisms work under their um, the, their respective uh, treaty instruments. So the Human Rights Committee works under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The CERD uh, Committee works under the Convention on Elimination of uh, Racial Discrimination. Uh, the SESCR under the uh, uh, con Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So there are various uh, treaty instruments uh, and uh, as bodies, each one of us is bound to uh, interpret uh, its own provisions. Of course, we take into consideration, you know, what is happening in the world around us, especially uh, in the, the bodies um, around us. Uh, I don't, I am not, I do not think uh, 
that there is uh, really um, uh, uh, a divergence in the positions expressed by CERD or the Human Rights uh, Committee. I just want to stress this, that, you know, we are working under different instruments. And in, in the case of the Human Rights Committee, uh, as I stated before, we do have Article 1 on the, uh, the issue of self-determination, uh, which, of course, infuses the other articles uh, of the, the specific articles of the uh, International Covenant, um, but which in itself does not give an individual a right, if you wish, to um, uh, raise a, a claim under this specific article in particular. But this article on internal self-determination infuses, I will repeat this, the interpretation the committee gives to uh, the rights uh, under the covenant accorded to groups or members of indigenous groups or minorities uh, and, uh, and so forth. Um, so this is just in a nutshell um, what uh, I could say uh, in a reaction, if not a response to the question raised. Thank you, Professor Patsartis. Next, uh, Dr. Matthias Oren from uh, Tromsø University. And uh, the topic is Sami membership reflections on experiences in Sweden. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank me. Uh, thank you also for allowing me to take part in this important uh, meeting. It's been very interesting so far, and I trust it will continue to be so. I should clarify that I, I was a professor at the university, or rather the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø until very recently, but I was still connected and doing work for the law faculty there. I was a professor of law. Um, uh, and before that, uh, it goes back to the morning discussion. I was working for the Sami Council and was uh, head of their human rights work, and that included being very heavily, deeply involved in the negotiations on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which have been referred to many times so far and surely will continue to be so. And interestingly, for this particular setting was that there were a lot and substantial discussions on a definition of some or indigenous peoples in, in those negotiations, but in the end, the issue was dropped because, simply because it was too difficult to, to reach an agreement on, on a definition. But also, there were absolutely no discussions on a definition of who belonged to those groups that qualify for rights under the, the, the declaration. That was simply in line with uh, international law in general, including with, in line with the ILO, as we heard, that the definition of who belongs to the group that was clear in those negotiations that would be left on the national level and to the uh, right to self-determination of the indigenous peoples concerned. Uh, I would also say before I get into my actual presentation that this discussion is not new, uh, including those uh, arguments we, we, we heard and listened to this morning, uh, including when Professor Shainin referred to the, the different position taken by some and then uh, uh, Dr. Yuna Yuna. I actually wrote together with Ante Aikyu an article on this precise topic already in 2014. And it's called A Reply to Calls for an Extension of the Definition of Sami in Finland. And it can be found in article review on law and politics uh, from that year, 2014, for those interested. So then moving into my presentation, I have been asked then to comment on how Sami in Sweden have traditionally identified members of the group. And I say Sweden, although I don't think really that there is much of a difference on, on based on our country level here. I think it's it's, it's more on the Sami uh, tradition and culture, irrespective of national borders. So I will say a few things about that, but uh, as you will know, it will not take me too much time. Uh, I will also um, say a few words about how these issues are, are addressed in, in uh, in Swedish law at present, and then in the end, I will offer some um, uh, observations from a more uh, legalistic point of view. Uh, I have my roots in a Sami reindeer herding community in Sweden, uh, but I didn't grow up there and I have never lived there, um, although I've been visiting a number of times a year and to engage in reindeer herding activities. But 
still, this is not really my area of expertise. So therefore, preparing for this presentation, I, I talk to some people. Uh, how they view that are more involved, deeply involved in, in the Sami traditional society. And they really confirmed my own thinking uh, on this issue when I was asked to address this topic. And I think the starting point is that in the Sami culture, uh, at least where I come from, it's a deep trait. It's a, a very something very entrenched in the culture that you keep track of, of uh, persons. In, in, in the society, uh, where they belong in, 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 in the societal system, what family they belongs to, uh, and so on. It's very important in this traditional Sami society, in my experience, to, to be aware and have knowledge about how what persons fit where in, in, in different families. Uh, and then we are not talking about uh, nucleus families, uh, as but rather as extended families, as they would be called in a Scandinavian and Finnish context, it's families way beyond second cousins and so on. Uh, but this knowledge is not really about who is Sami in a wider sense. Uh, it's not that in a kind of thinking of a definition of Sami and so on. It's just uh, knowledge that stretches as far as is practically necessary. You need to know who is who, for your daily life, who know you're dealing with, perhaps uh, who you are marrying, and so on. In other words, it's a really local, or at most a regional knowledge. It's not a knowledge about or an understanding or interest in who is Sami in a more uh, general uh, understanding of the term. Of course, uh, this changed somewhat and uh, developed somewhat with new um, means of communication, new means of uh, transportations, the establishment of some organizations and so on, uh, a greater amount of uh, intermarriages between different uh, Sami regions and so on. But I think it was still uh, predominantly, and, and what was important was to know your, your own neighborhood and the neighborhoods next to you, those that you would uh, uh, potentially encounter in, in, in various ways, rather than having an idea of who was Sami in a more general understanding of the term. And I think, even though I don't have any uh, scientific knowledge to back this up, but I think this issue that we are talking about today on who is Sami, defining who is Sami, deciding who is Sami, really became an issue only with the establishment of the Sami parliaments. That's when this became something that uh, had to be addressed and have, as we can see, evidence of today as well, it, it, it arouses a lot of emotions and, and so on, and discussion also on, on a legal level. But I think that issue only um, emerged with the establishment of the Sami parliaments. And that's also when you went from identifying who is Sami without really, uh, or identifying who is who in the system without really making any kind of judgments on who is in the group and who is not, to deciding who is Sami, where you started then to, to decide that this person uh, uh, is a, a Sami individual and that person is not. I think that really came uh, only with the establishment of the Sami parliaments. It's a rather new topic in, in, in my view and experience. Uh, And I think also in general, uh, the, um, that uh, the, the need and uh, the, the, the drive to define and decide who is Sami, it has come in general also when uh, the Sami status, if one used that term, uh, became connected with rights and entitlements. That's when you had to start to decide who, who is Sami. And that also means that uh, there need not be one understanding of Sami, but rather for depending on the context, depending on the right or entitlement, there can be different definitions of Sami that fits that particular uh, purpose that you're dealing with at, in, in that particular context. So here I agree with the draft commission report where it underlines, and we have heard others speak to this also this morning, that it only, the draft commission uh, report says, it only seeks to uh, decide who is Sami for the particular purpose of who can enlist in, in the electoral role. 
In other words, it's not a decision on who belongs to the sum. It's not a, it is, uh, an issue of identity. It's simply an issue of who can enlist in, in the role. And I, I agree with that. So that said, I will then say a few words about uh, the, the Swedish law on this matter, which is uh, the Sami Parliament Act. Uh, first, it employs the two generation criterion, meaning that uh, you need to have a, a two generations back, uh, the grandparent that had Sami as a mother tongue uh, in order to be able to, uh, or allowed to, to enlist in the electoral role. Uh, it, it does not include the third generation, which is now proposed in, in, in this proposal to amendments to the, uh, the Finnish Army Parliament Act. And who, the per, a person that thinks that she or he uh, meet these criteria will then have to uh, file an application with the Army Parliament's election commission. And that election commission, which is appointed by the Army Parliament, will then take a decision if, uh, if this person indeed qualify. Uh, and if they should come to the conclusion that the person uh, does not, then she or he has the opportunity to apply or appeal, sorry, uh, to, um, to the uh, county administrative board, Landstyrelsen in Swedish, which will then make a final decision. The, uh, the county administrative board's decision is not uh, possible to, to appeal any further. And I haven't dug very deep into this issue, but uh, my feeling, my sense, what I know is that it's rare for, for the county administrative board to uh, overturn uh, the decision taken by the Southern Parliament's election committee. It happens, but it's relatively rare or very rare possibly uh, in, in, in my experience and to my knowledge. But again, I, this is not really something I have uh, looked into uh, very intensively. Uh, so that said, I will then finally uh, end with some uh, point of uh, law, and particularly international law, on, on this matter. Uh, I think one has to first acknowledge that to take decisions on or define who belongs to an indigenous people, and this, in this case the Sami, and even more particularly the Sami in Finland, is inherently difficult. It is a very difficult topic, as we can hear also from the discussions today. I think, um, though, one thing is clear and, and uh, must be recognized, that any definition of Sami cannot rely solely on self-identification criteria. You cannot just have a subjective criteria because that is a carte blanche to assimilation. If you only apply a self-identification criteria, then a large number of persons, uh, potentially the entire population of the country, could identify as Sami. And uh, that would basically mean that there are no Sami because if everyone is Sami and no one is Sami, it's exactly the same thing, at least from a, a legal point of view. So uh, having a pure self-identification criteria that, uh, that opens up for assimilation, and uh, then we are talking about violations of, uh, of international law when it comes to, for instance, the rights of forced assimilation and deprivation of cultural identity. So, uh, I think we have solved this and we then need uh, any any definition must include objective criteria. And that is also why all uh, international um, attempts to define uh, indigenous peoples on the collective level, Professor Sainin spoke to a few this morning, include objective criteria on the collective level. Uh, and let me again say that none of these, none of these, including ILO 169, uh, include any attempt to uh, uh, identify what persons on the individual individual level belongs to the group. That is again left to the national level. But I think that these definitions stress the importance that must be a, a, a collective uh, criterion in addition to the subjective one of some kind. And uh, I can just then add myself to the, what's been said about the Finnish Supreme uh, Administrative Court's approach to this when this overall considerations with a strong uh, 
emphasis on the, this uh, self-identification. It simply uh, um, uh, is not in conformity with international law and in my view, a very odd and problematic approach to uh, identification on the individual level. I think it can simply not be substantiated. Uh, so clear that must be an objective criteria, but which then becomes the issue, obviously. And that is not, well, it's easy in one way, but it's um, difficult in another, because here, I think the law uh, stops guiding us. There is really no um, guidance to be found in, 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 uh, in legal sources on what should be the objective criteria. It is simply uh, a political decision. You have to decide yourself uh, what are uh, the objective criteria that you want to uh, employ to define who belongs to an indigenous group, and the, in this case, the Sami and the Sami in Finland. That is something that you simply have to agree on. Uh, there is no right or wrong answer to this issue. My position is not more valuable than any of yours. Uh, so, uh, so what should be the criteria the, the law says very little about? Uh, but it, having said that, it says the law says is quite clear on if it doesn't say much about what which should be the criteria, it says something about who should decide the criteria. And it's been mentioned by many today uh, that it here ref refers to, and we saw that in a ruling and also uh, in Tina Sander IQ versus Finland, uh, that the Human Rights Committee took this position, and we have seen it in the, um, the, the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 33 1. And, and uh, also that we saw, even though the right to self determination is not included in ILO 169, that ILO interpretive bodies have also taken this approach that this is a matter for the Sami people itself, uh, indigenous people itself and Sami people in this case. It's a matter, it falls under the scope of the Sami peoples, in this case the Sami population in Finland, right to internal self-determination. First and foremost, they have to decide what should be the objective criteria uh, to, uh, to identify what individuals are members of the Sami people. It's a matter for the Sami people itself uh, under the, the right to self-determination, uh, which is clearly an, uh, established in international law. Uh, of course, uh, this has to be, uh, this right, the collective right has to be re exercised with respect uh, the, to the individual rights to belong and the individual right to cultural identity and so on. Uh, and it must be, first and foremost, non-discriminatory, the approach. Uh, but it's still with this uh, respect for the individual right, the, 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 the decision right west with the Sami people. And on this uh, balance that has to be done against the uh, in, in individual's rights, I would like to, to refer to Professor Patrick Thornberry, former member of the third committee, uh, who has observed that the right to belong to a group does not apply to absurd claims of belonging by those without community connection or acceptance. So this individual right is, can only be taken so far. Uh, but having noted uh, um, that the decision right West, within this case the Sami people and the uh, indigenous peoples in general, uh, one should uh, acknowledge, I think, it, uh, that we have here actually who came first, the hen or the egg uh, riddle hidden here. Uh, because uh, when you have an indigenous people who is to decide who belongs to the group, that really presupposes that the membership of the group that is to make this decision, that is the decision who belongs, is decided. That, that group that uh, have, the, have been vested with the right to define who is a member of the group that group must, must be known, that must in, 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 in turn have been defined or identified. But how is this possible when the decision to made, be made is precisely on who belongs to the group? I think there is a little bit of a circle argument here that could be problematic, uh, uh, at least formally, but I suppose that you just have to find a practical workable solution. 
uh, that is respectful of the fact that at the end of the day, the decision-making right here rests with uh, the indigenous people, in this case, the Sami people. Finally, uh, I just uh, want to, to register that um, I am personally uh, not in favor, or I would say strongly adverse, to the free generation criterion not now being proposed. Uh, it's been aptly noted by others before uh, that uh, if your only connection with the Sami culture and society is three generations away, if that's the only connection you have, how much of the Sami culture and thinking and so on can you actually have absorbed? Uh, I would say in most cases, if your only connection is three generations back, probably none. And that would mean that your connection to the Sami then are only genetic, uh, not cultural. Uh, and then we are moving, and it's been said before, then we are starting to move uh, towards the North American approach and blood quota and so on. If your only connection to the Sami is genetic, uh, then we are not talking about the cultural connection, we're talking about something else. And uh, I'm wondering if that is the, the, the approach uh, we want to take. Uh, my personal opinion is if we're going to move in any direction, it's the other way around, that they actually narrow the definition of the Sami. And I would take that approach, even if that would mean that I myself uh, would be excluded from, from definitions. Because again, go back to what we are dealing with here is just definitions in a particular context. In this case, the context of who can enlist on the electoral role. It has nothing to do with identity. And therefore, and I think that should be considered when one decide on uh, what are the suitable definitions, that it's only a legal technical solution for the particular context. It does, says nothing about who is a Sami, who has Sami identity, so on. That's a different issue, uh, which is not legal. And uh, I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthias Oren. Uh, we have time for one question, and the question comes from Mikko Vartiainen. Uh, and it's a broad question, but uh, again, a brief answer would be appreciated. The question is, what is the relation between the law and the politics? Is the law political? Well, th that would depend, and it's difficult to answer this uh, <laughs> quickly. Uh, of course, law can be political in the sense that you have politicians that create law in the Finnish parliament, for example. Uh, but law is also created by non-political institutions, such as the Supreme Court of Finland, but also of the bodies we have heard from today, the international uh, legal institutions, the Human Rights Committee, the Third Committee, and, and, uh, and so on. So yes, it's, it's a combination. And it's been tons written on this, so it's difficult to answer in a, in a very short way. But yes, uh, in a way, ultimately the law is uh, is political because the uh, politicians can step in and change the law if they are not happy with it. But uh, meanwhile, and um, as it works in the society, as it moves on, you have a number of institutions that makes law that are uh, are not politicians, but by experts, judges, and so on, on the national levels, in courts, on the international levels, also in, in, in courts like the um, European uh, Court on Human Rights, uh, which then its ruling would be law in Finland, uh, and these uh, human rights treaty bodies that I also referred to. So there is a combination. Uh, some law is created uh, by politicians, uh, but law is also created by other institutions that are not uh, not political and should not be where it's very important they are separated from uh, from the political system and they should be independent uh, and we, we have a discussion in europe now that where some countries are accused of uh, wanting to erase the, the 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 border between politics and the the courts but as in in a healthy democracy in a healthy liberal democracy you have uh, institutions that are not political, that also creates law and which it checks the law uh, which the politician seeks to create. I hope that was uh, an answer to the question. 
Thank you, Dr. Matthias Oren, and thank you for joining the discussion today. Then uh, I'm wondering, is um, Dr. Laila Susanne Vash already online? Yes, looks like the connection is working. Uh, and uh, I'll mention here that uh, she's also a member of the UN Human Rights Council's expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, the MRIP, um, in addition to being, of course, an expert on Sami rights in many respects. And the topic today is Sami membership reflections on experiences in Norway. The floor is yours. Olugeito Pirita. Uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation to participate in this uh, really important uh, webinar. Munlan um, Inguna Susanna El Maria Laila Susanna. That was my presentation of uh, my family going back four generations. For those of you who are Sami, now you know uh, which uh, family I belong to and where I come from. Uh, I'm going to share my presentation with you. So um, I wanted to start by by uh, commending the drafting committee for this uh, really impressive work with proposing amendments to the Sami Parliament Act in Finland um, with the aim of um, reassuring um, that Finnish legislation is in compliance with uh, international human rights standards. And as uh, Birita already said, I'm also one of the members of the U United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And um, apart from that, I have a PhD in international law from the Arctic University of Norway, where I've been um, for 10 years, both as student as an academic. Now, currently, I'm the rector of the Sami University here in Guadagaino. So um, I've been asked to uh, share some experiences from the Norwegian side of Sami, uh, saying a few words about the process of establishing and strengthening the unautonomous body representing the Sami people in Norway. And I want to start off by saying something about uh, what might be the most central question uh, for everybody discussing this, namely that what is the traditional way of determining who belongs to the Sami people? Starting off with the, with the most uh, difficult question. So from my perspective, and I come from the North Sami region, um, I come from Gordgeno, which is one of the uh, main Sami traditional areas, both for reindeer herding, but also for uh, Sami culture. It's a, a municipality where a majority belongs to the Sami people. Um, when I was asked about how do we traditionally determine who belongs to the Sami people, um, then um, I looked into research, but I also uh, did the same as, as Matthias. I spoke to our elders. Uh, my own grandmother is 91 years old and she explained to me how this is done in a traditional way. Although we don't have the tendency of being very verbal about it and we don't have the tradition of writing about these customs, that makes it a bit difficult for outsiders to access this information, but and I recognize that. But at the same time, uh, I also think we should recognize our oral traditions and our customary structures. Um, so the traditional Sami Sita or Sita societies had their own legal cultures and systems, and this was prior to colonization and assimilation policies. Of course, assimilation changed the way our societies uh, worked and also kind of uh, made it more difficult to see the Sami own legal culture. Uh, it was in in many ways um, replaced by the Norwegian court systems, um, the the farmer society, uh, the what became the majority population, majority people in Norway. Um, 
they wanted the Sami communities to fit in to the Norwegian legal way of thinking. Um, that meant, of course, that they wanted not to strengthen Sami traditional uh, decision making structures uh, or legal culture. So what I did uh, when I presented myself to you, I mentioned the heads of my Sami family three or four generations back. I recognized that some people for some reason don't know their Sami history. I have family members myself who's, who has been adopted by uh, Norwegian families and they have not that kind of knowledge that I've been told since I was a child about who are my ancestors, where did they come from, what were their livelihoods, etc. This is a very fundamental part of uh, the relationships that we have to each other, uh, the relationship that is between Sami families, between reindeer husband residas, uh, between communities, and also between the different language regions or uh, language areas. So you can either decide um, on the relationship to the Sami people through, um, through the family, or you can also present yourself belonging to a Sami reindeer husband receiver uh, by mentioning the lands that you belong to, the historic continuity that your family has to those lands, to the region, um, and also there is this important aspect of collective recognition, uh, which is, again, very difficult for outsiders to grasp, and it's difficult for us to explain because it's an oral way of doing things. We don't have the tradition of writing down these kinds of um, criteria. And it also uh, can be different uh, in different Sami areas. Uh, it can vary a, a bit, but not so much in my experience. So with this like historical Sami traditional customary um, introduction, I will then turn to the legislation. Um, the Sami having experienced very harsh assimilation policies in Norway, um, of course, we see the consequences for the use of Sami languages today, as many Sami people don't speak Sami language. And we also see very concretely that many area, in many areas, the original Sami place names were replaced by Norwegian names. Uh, so that is some very concrete uh, results of the assimilation policies. Uh, the Sami is recognized as the only indigenous people in Norway, and that was done as early as in 1989, uh, when Norway was the first country to ratify the ILO Convention 169. Uh, in the proceedings of the parliament, they mention, they clarify uh, the foundation for ratification, and there they specific, specifically uh, state that the Sami uh, are to be considered as an indigenous people in Norway. This view has also been strengthened by the Norwegian Supreme Court in their practice and also in the new Norwegian Language Act where the Sami languages are recognized as indigenous languages in Norway. But the Norwegian constitution doesn't use the term indigenous people and the reason for that is that that term wasn't commonly used in Norway in the 1980s when the constitutional amendment was adopted by the Norwegian parliament. Uh, however, uh, for the past few years, there's been an ongoing discussion in the Norwegian parliament about including the term indigenous people in our constitutional amendment, uh, paragraph one, uh, 108 which states that the authorities of the state shall create conditions enabling the Sami people to preserve and develop its language, culture and way of life. Um, so this is an ongoing discussion. The parliament hasn't decided um, on whether it should say the Sami as a people, uh, as an indigenous people, 
or as um, it says also in the Norwegian language, uh, the original language, it says Folkegruppe, which is uh, a population. Um, Norway has ratified most international human rights conventions. Um, as I mentioned, first country in the world to ratify the ILO 169 and supports the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is important when we dive into the Sami Act regulations. This is the human, the international um, framework that Norway needs to comply with. And Norway recognizes the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as expression of existing international law and that Sami have a right to self-determination under common article one of the ICCPR and the ICESCR. And that means that uh, our parliament and government recognizes that the Sami have a right to self-determination and self-government. And then how, do, how is this being implemented when it comes to the Sami parliament and the elections? We have a, a what's called a Samatings law of Sami Act in Norway. It was uh, uh, adopted in 1987, uh, but it came to force in 1989 when uh, the Sami parliament was established. In chapter one, in the general provisions, you can see that the purpose of the act is to, is to strengthen the autonomy of the Sami people. And you can confer, confer if you want to uh, really dig into the, the trouble for the Sami Act, then you can read the Sami Rights Committee from uh, 1984 and also read some of the articles of its uh, former chair, Supreme Court Justice Professor Karsten Smith. In paragraph 1.1, it states that the purpose of the Sami Act is to enable the Sami people in Norway to safeguard and develop the, their language, culture and way of life. Um, so this means that the Sami Act should both protect and develop Sami languages, culture and livelihoods. Uh, and that also includes, in my opinion, the Sami autonomous social structures and decision making processes, including ways of determining Sami membership. Now, why am I saying that? Yes, because the act itself doesn't define Sami membership. It refers to the Sami parliament as a representative body for the Sami, but the Sami needs to decide for themselves who is Sami. So paragraph 1.1 is inspired by the wording of the Convention on the Civil and Political Rights, Article 27. And it's commonly understood stood, uh, that it is to be interpreted in the same way as Article 27. So that means that it's a dynamic interpretation of uh, the term culture, also including ec economic activities of the Sami. So paragraph 1-2 in the Sami Act establishes the representative body for the Sami people, the Sami Digi. And uh, it states that the Sami people are to have their own nationwide Samting or Samadigi elected by and among the Sami population. And here again, the population word is uh, used in the um, constitutional amendment, but it's um, and it can be a bit confusing since uh, Norwegian authorities both use Sami population or Sami people in official documents and in official translations. Um, so the Sami parliamentary elections are held every four years in Norway. Every Sami person registered in the Sami parliament electoral register has the right to vote and can also freely decide to leave the register. Some do that for political reasons if they want to use it as a way of showing their um, uh, political views of how the Sami parliament is um, working or the political, uh, uh, the political issues that they are dealing with. But the Sami Act, as I said, does not define who belongs to the Sami people or how this membership is determined. Only who should have the right to vote at the Sami Digi elections. So membership is determined through Sami customs. And here you can also confirm with the uh, declaration article 33. 
So this is actually in conformity with Article 33 of the UN Declaration. So uh, to look more in detail, what does this mean? Um, uh, both the right to vote and the right to be a candidate for the Sami Digi elections are ways of making sure that the Sami people's rights are being respected and implemented. And this is often forgotten in the public debate about the electoral role. You have to remember the role of the Sami parliament as a self-governing body and as a um, body that secures the Sami a voice into the Norwegian parliament and into the Norwegian government system. We met, uh, it is very clear when you read the travel for the Sami Act that the Sami minority rights uh, was the, the fundamental uh, idea behind the establishment of the Sami parliament. The Sami minority voice must be heard uh, because Sami people will always be in a they will be in a permanent minority situation in Norway, Sweden and Finland. So this is a very sensitive issue also, since um, you need to protect the Sami people also from the, um, to make sure that their culture and traditional livelihoods and social structures, structures is respected. And, and this is kind of a sensitive topic. Um, but in the act itself, there are two criteria, and this uh, might be very familiar for you. So you have the objective and subjective criteria. Uh, you have to, um, in order to be included, um, the following criteria must be met, and it's stipulated in section 2.6 of the SAMI Act. Everyone that, uh, or anyone who declares that they consider themselves to be SAMI, and who either has a Sami, has Sami as his or her home language or first language, um, or has or has had a parent, grandparent, or great grandparent with Sami as his or her home language, or who is a child of someone who is or has been registered in the Sami Parliament's electoral roll, has a right to be enrolled in the electoral roll of the Sami Parliament in the municipality of residence. And this um, act has been amended, or this paragraph has been amended several times. Language criteria goes back many generations, and Matthias uh, said that he was a bit critical to that. Um, I've looked into the trouble, looking into why they wanted to go as far back as great grandparent. Um, this is made to ensure that Sami families who have not learned their native language have the opportunity to vote and run for elections. But that doesn't mean that this is a permanent um, criteria. There is an ongoing debate here in Norway whether paragraph 26 should be changed, and we are looking very interested into the discussions that is that are happening in Finland. As some believe, particularly uh, the subjective criteria, but also the objective criteria uh, can be misused. It can also be misunderstood by persons who clearly do not belong to the Sami people and who hence will not be accepted as true representatives of the Sami people. I have some examples since I have been working in the administration of the Sami parliament in Norway that we had a German tourist applied for being enrolled in the electoral roll. And by a mistake, he was actually enrolled. But through, I will say how we discovered this uh, at a later um, in, in uh, my next slides. So this is something very important to monitor uh, how this electoral role is being um, managed. So how many Sami persons have a right to vote at the Sami Digi elections in Norway? Um, the, uh, the last statistics we have is from 2019, and there were 18,103 persons with a right to vote. Uh, we don't have disaggregated data. We don't have secure data when it comes to how many Samis there are in Norway. Um, some say it's about 40,000, but that number has been used for 40 years. So uh, we don't have any um, recent numbers uh, indicating how many Samis there are. 
in Norway, and it's a very difficult issue also to register ethnicity and Sami uh, kinship. Um, the Sami Parliament Act itself, you need to read it. Um, you need to read the regulations also for the Sami Parliament Act. And this is my final um, slide. Uh, this is very important as the regulations in detail explains how the monitoring happens. And this is kind of the closest that we get of uh, describing how the autonomy of the Sami people is being respected through these uh, regulations. And it's a forskrift, and that means that it's a part of the legislation, it's adopted by the Norwegian parliament. So firstly, the purpose of the legislation is to uh, secure that the authorities of the state shall create conditions enabling the Sami people through free, direct and uh, yeah, free direct elections to elect their own representatives to the Sami Digi, the Sami parliament. And it's the Sami Digi administration that receive application and decides who fulfill the criteria according to paragraph five of this reg uh, regulation. But there is a right to appeal and it's important also to make sure that there is a right to appeal uh, if there are any mistakes done by the Sami parliament when uh, managing the electoral role. So according to paragraph nine, uh, one, if a person is enrolled by a mistake and if someone wants to object to the enrollment of a person to the electoral role, you can send a written complaint to the Sami parliament and the complaint should be justified. So you have to explain why uh, a person shouldn't be enrolled. So it's not enough just to uh, send um, a complaint asking for someone to be, be removed. The Same Digi administration will then update the electoral role and remove any persons who they, after assessing the case, conclude do not fulfill the objective criteria they can of course not uh, conclude that someone do not fulfill the subjective criteria. Um, the Norwegian department's courts have no right to overrule the decisions of the Sami Digi, as this is a matter of internal self-determination for the Sami in Norway. So the Sami Digi, the Sami parliament administration, not the political part of the, of the uh, Sami Digi, it's the administrative part who decides and there is a separate um, committee who looks into uh, the cr criteria and also all applications. And uh, to make sure that Sami communities also make sure that there are no um, people in the electoral role that are wrongly uh, admitted to the electoral role, um, you can actually access the, the whole electoral role. Uh, making it transparent for Sami communities in Norway. This also gives the right for persons in the electoral role, the right to be removed from the electoral role if, if you no longer want to be there. So the electoral role for the Sami parliament elections in Norway is open for public assessment for the Sami who participate in the elections, making it possible for them as representatives of Sami communities to ensure that only members of the Sami people are in the electoral role. And this is a reflection of the right Sami right to autonomy, customs for group recognition, and also you can confirm with the UN declaration, particularly Article 33, when it comes to um, recognition um, by the group regarding membership. So this is how it works in Norway and it has worked Pretty well, we have some, of course, examples of people like that German tourist being accepted into the electoral role. But through this transparent process and when the Sami have the opportunity to look into the electoral role and also to make complaints about people who should not be there, then these uh, um, mistakes are being um, that we actually find out if there is someone in that electoral role who shouldn't be there. So thank you so much. We have one question from Reta Toivonen, University of Helsinki. Laila Sosanevash, Norwegian Sami parliament has never felt the need 
to exclude anyone from registering in the electoral roll on the Norwegian side of SAFMI. Would you tell to the audience why is this? Uh, well, um, it is quite a difficult question because, of course, we have this ongoing discussion uh, both in the Sami parliament among the we have the political parties represented in the Sami parliament, which, which makes it a bit different than the Sami parliament in Finland, where you have uh, representatives directly chosen by the Sami people, not through political parties. So that might be one explanation that we have a different system uh, that is very focused on the political parties instead of individuals. Um, that we don't have the same kind of discussion as in Finland might be because the Sami parliament decides for itself. It's not any supreme administrative court who can decide or overrule the decisions of the Sami parliament. So if the Sami parliament decides that someone should be removed from the electoral roll, they are removed. And there is no uh, way of going to the courts or anywhere else to overrule that decision because that's an, a matter of internal self-determination for the Sami people. I guess that is one explanation. We don't have the same system as in Finland where you have actually have the opportunity for the Finnish courts to overrule the decisions of the Sami parliament. But I guess if we would in the future be in the same situation that we have, uh, we don't have administrative courts in Norway, but if you have any court trying to overrule the decision of the Sami parliament, then we would have the same discussion as in Finland. But not now, because it is not, it's a non-issue and it hasn't been an issue to establish that form of, of uh, complaints mechanism. There is no need for that as long as it works and the Sami people accept the way that it's been done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Laila Susanne Vash. Director Morten Kjärum, member of CERD in 2002 to 2008. And the topic is the approach by the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Oh, thanks a lot for the uh, for the invitation to participate in this uh, extremely important uh, seminar. And, uh, and first of all, of course, I have to apologize not only for the entry hiccups, but also for attending at this uh, late st stage. But I had some prior engagement uh, all morning that I couldn't, that I had to attend to. So therefore bear with me uh, that I cannot relate to uh, what has already been talked about. And of course, I also run the, the risk of repeating things that have already been said, but um, with that, uh, let me uh, get started. The reason why I was in, uh, why I'm invited to this uh, seminar is that I was a member of a CERT from uh, 2002 to 2008, and therefore I took uh, part in the examination of Finland uh, in 2003. It was my uh, then colleague, uh, Mr. Hörnbl, uh, from Austria, who was the country rapporteur of Finland for that examination. Just to mention that I sort of didn't have a particular role to play. Uh, during the examination, but of course took part uh, in the discussion as uh, a regular uh, treaty body member. And the key uh, documents relevant for the discussion uh, are the uh, two third uh, recommendations, uh, recommendation eight uh, from uh, 1999 and general recommendation 23 uh, on the rights of indigenous uh, people uh, from uh, 1997. I'll come back to them uh, in a second. But now when rereading, uh, it has really been an interesting uh, journey sort of back in uh, in history, almost 20 years uh, has uh, gone by. Uh, but when reading the third recommendations to Finland from all the examinations from uh, 2003, 9, 12 and 17 uh, on the issues of defining uh, who may be considered a Sami, it is uh, obvious that there are different approaches to the issue in the uh, first uh, uh, examinations, uh, 2003 and 9, and then a shift in 2012 and 17. And of course, the question is how this can be understood, what, uh, what happened here. In 2003, and this is where I just wanted to put up the text, uh, uh, the third uh, wrote, and I quote, uh, the committee is of the opinion that the state party's approach to the definition of who may be considered a Sami 
and thus fall under the relevant legislation established in favor of this army is too restrictive. And then there's some more text and then they uh, conclude accordingly. Uh, the committee suggests that the state party give more adequate weight to self-identification by the individual as indicated in General Recommendation 8. And I'll come back to General Recommendation 8 later. This was then repeated uh, in 2009. Then we move to 2012 and 17. Uh, and here the committee shifted its focus and expressed concern about the rights of the Sami people to self-determination. In 2017, uh, the committee concludes that, and again I quote, in line with its general recommendation number 23 on the rights of indigenous peoples, the committee reiterates its recommendation that in defining who is eligible to vote for members of the Sami parliament, the state party accord due weight to the rights of the Sami people to self-determination concerning their status within Finland to determine their own membership and to not be subjected to forced assimilation, end of quote. So what we see here is a shift in the weighing or the balancing between two rights, namely the right to self-identification and the right to self-determination. So, and this, of course, again, refers back to uh, General Recommendation 8 and uh, General Recommendation 3. And in General Recommendation uh, 8 uh, from, uh, uh, when was that from? Uh, I had that uh, before, uh, from 1990, yeah. Uh, the committee states, and I quote, the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, having considered reports from states, parties, concerning information about the ways in which individuals are identified as being members of particular racial or ethnic groups, group or groups, is of the opinion that such identification shall, if no justification exists to the country, be based upon self-identification by the individual concerned. Here the cert underscores the fundamental principle of self-identification, but not without exceptions, stating if no justification exists to the contrary. In General Recommendation 23, CERT affirms that discrimination against indigenous peoples falls under the scope of the convention and that all appropriate means must be taken to combat and elim eliminate such discrimination. And they go on, um, detail and but uh, then wind up by saying the committee especially calls upon states parties to recognize and protect the rights of indigenous peoples to own, develop, control and use their communal lands, territories uh, and resources and on and on. So this is sort of uh, where we stand both in, in terms of uh, uh, what was uh, said in the in the various uh, uh, recommendations following the concluding uh, observations and recommendations uh, to Finland, as well as in the uh, general recommendation 8 and 23. But let me just, before we just move on, then just say one thing. When you sit there as committee member, I'm sure there are several in the audience here, at least uh, Martin, uh, I know, is, has uh, been a form of a committee member and probably can confirm, uh, and others may as well. Uh, it is of essence when you deliberate on these issues, uh, it is key to have sufficient information to fully understand the complexities of the situation to really be able to conduct a proper analysis, reaching a well-balanced, well-considered recommendation. In particular, when two rights have to be weighed up against each other, as we have in this particular case. So when rereading the state report and the notes from the examination, it seems as if CERT, based on the information it received and the explanations given by the government, failed to fully understand the complexity in the question. CERT members asked many questions 
but seem to and it's a vague recollection recollection but they seem to be still bewildered about why so many cases in the end were rejected but that should also be seen in the light uh, of sort of the, the, the climate at that time in the end of the 90s beginning of the uh, the zeros the 2000s uh, because when considering these issues the committee uh, paid in those days a lot of attention to self-identification which took its outset in a considerable focus on minority issues, a serious focus on minority issues in Europe at the time. And in particular, I would say the, the Roma population and the Roma cases played in in many in various ways and sort of the understanding and the understanding of the enormous importance of the self uh, identification, the, the treatment of the Roma population in many of the Eastern and Central European countries. So I think these two features probably in sort of playing together, the one not fully getting or not getting the full picture and then uh, the, the climate at the time uh, in the committee and in, in general. What happened in subsequent sessions, of course, it's difficult for me to speak about because, as I said, I left uh, the committee in 2008. But going back and, and looking into it, I think there may be two two factors that have played into to this altered uh, interpretation of general recommendation eight in relation to self identification and then what constitute constitutes important justifications to the country, which could, for example, be self determination. The first thing that can have played in is that the committee with the altered practice of the Finnish Supreme Administrative Court actually realized certainly the full impact uh, or you could say the reading of the 2003 uh, recommendation and finds that this may be going too far. That was actually maybe not what they had in mind if they sort of say they had maybe phrased it differently if they had a, a full uh, picture of the, the situation. Um, and it challenged the right to self-determination. So that's one sort of a component. Uh, another one uh, could be that the, uh, the new or the renewed consideration of the various elements may also have been influenced by the increased attention to the I issues of indigenous peoples that developed in the 2000s, of course, culminating in 2007 with the adoption of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. In 2012, uh, CERT, the committee, makes several references uh, to the declaration, which I mean is not maybe all that surprising, but I mean it's quite normal that you, you look into uh, other uh, uh, legal texts that can sort of say, uh, help to interpret your own convention as long as of course it is in conformity in the end with the ICERT. In the 2017 recommendation, the committee exclusively references its own general recommendation 23, uh, which they actually could have done, I think, already uh, in 2012, but they were probably taken by sort of say, the, the strong focus on that declaration and the general uh, development in relation to uh, viewing uh, uh, the right to self-determination of indigenous people uh, at that time. This subtle shift uh, that say, we may have seen here, uh, I think we may also have seen uh, or see uh, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on, on some of these cases. Uh, I think I can detect it, but uh, it definitely takes more research. Uh, so the many researchers here, maybe someone have uh, looked into it, that'd be great. But otherwise, it may be something interesting to, to really uh, dig further into. But I think there is a, a shift, which is not only in relation to to uh, to CERT, but also the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So in conclusion, the challenges in this particular regard uh, is in the balancing between self-identification and self-determination. The third process in relation to Finland is, in that view, I think, a, a very interesting and telling case. And at the same time, I have to underscore that I think there's no doubt 
what the practice uh, or the interpretation uh, by CERT uh, is today. So with that, uh, uh, I don't think I have so much more to, to add, and I think also my time is uh, up. So thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Laila Susanne-Nevash will address the MRIP comments. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Birita, and, and also um, I wasn't really prepared for presenting also the expert mechanism uh, views as I'm not one of the members who are working on this um, country engagement, but uh, as expert mechanism, we always are informed about what the other members are working on. So fortunately, I've been briefed and also received all documentation. So I can present to you the work of, of the uh, team members of the Finnish, uh, the Finland request. Um, I think I will use a minute or two just to explain a little bit uh, for those of you who might not know the expert mechanism and why we are working with this issue of the Sami Parliament Act in Finland. Um, the expert mechanism is a body under the Human Rights Council in the United Nations and we provide expertise and advice on the rights of indigenous peoples and in particular uh, on implementation of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we assist member states of the United Nations in achieving the goals of the Declaration. And we conduct studies um, to advance the promotion and protect the protection of indigenous peoples' rights. Um, we do inter alia, we do clarifications on the impl implications of key principles uh, such as self-determination and free prior and informed consent. Uh, we examine good practices from different states uh, which in order can in inspire other states to, um, to follow in the same uh, or to learn from other, other states. Uh, we also see and, and give the Human Rights Council some advice on the challenges that we see uh, pertaining to indigenous people's rights and the implementation on the national and regional level. And we also suggest measures for UN member states uh, and they can so that they can adopt uh, different kinds of resolutions. Um, also provide uh, providing protection of indigenous people's rights and there are different aspects of the expert mechanism mandate one of them is the country engagement part um, which means that uh, indigenous peoples organizations or even indigenous peoples in, like in this case a parliament representing the indigenous uh, sami people can make a request to the uh, expert mechanism. The same um, possibility is also provided for states. States can also make requests to our uh, expert mechanism for technical advice and helping facilitate dialogue in difficult uh, processes regarding uh, implementation of the rights of indigenous peoples. So um, that was just in short, uh, a very briefly about our mandate and about the experts. We are seven experts and we are appointed by the Human Rights Council and we are selected on the basis of our competence and experience in the rights of indigenous peoples. So we represent seven different social cultural regions of the world. And uh, Professor Megan Davis, uh, she is the head of the team working on this country engagement, which originally came about when the Sami Parliament uh, requested that the expert mechanism could help some, uh, could provide some advice uh, on the drafting of these amendments to the Sami Parliament Act in Finland. So um, I'm sure that you have all received our. Uh, written documents. I can also provide in the chat 
some links to uh, this country engagement. You can visit the expert mechanism website uh, where you can find a little bit background information. And there are three, um, three documents. Uh, it's the original request from the Sami parliament. And then we also have our initial comments when we conducted this country visit in 2018. And I apologize if, apologize if I said 2017 earlier today, it was 2018. So then we uh, traveled in Finland and in Sami areas and also the delegation that's in charge of this, the team working on this, they had really um, some good uh, discussions with the government representatives of Finland and also the Sami parliament in Finland. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank the government of Finland for your continued support and for um, including the expert mechanism into this process and also um, making sure that we are also able to assist finding good solutions, uh, making sure that the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is being implemented in Finland. Um, I will then say something about our latest um, um, comment or our follow-up response. Um, I should also mention that whenever we go on country visits, we also have the opportunity to um, have follow-up visits and we also have the opportunity to have follow-up responses but that is of course if both parties uh, agree to that so it's very much um, an open dialogue and the MRIP role is to facilitate that dialogue. Um, so we have provided some comments on um, from uh, on the draft that we received in May 2021 and I will briefly go through uh, those comments. And you should also be aware that there, uh, these are the second set of comments provided by the expert mechanism uh, since we published our advisory notes in March 2018. All of these are public documents and you can easily access, ac access them uh, at our website. So please read this latest comment in conjunction with our initial advisory notes and the first set of comments that we provided then. And then we've had a good meeting with representatives of the Sami Parliament uh, June 2nd uh, to hear the Sami Parliament's uh, views on the content of the current draft. Um, the expert mechanism welcomes the opportunity to continue to comment on, on the process and also the draft legislation. And, and we note that many of the suggestions have already been incorporated into the text. Many of our initial uh, comments and, and our concerns. Uh, in our original advisory note in 2018, we suggested that the Sami parliament as representative as a representative and implementing institution of constitutional provisions should play a more prominent role in deciding who is a Sami for the purpose of registration in the electoral role. Um, Section 3 of the Sami Parliament Act on the definition of a Sami should be guided by the primary objective of preserving Sami culture through enhanced group recognition of who is a Sami in accordance with uh, the Sami traditions and customs as required by Section 17 and 121 of the Finnish Constitution and Articles 9 and 33 of the UN Declaration. Uh, further, we suggested that enhanced group recognition should, however, include an individual claims process based on non-discrimination and appeals should take a Sami culturally sensitive approach by including in the appeals mechanism indigenous experts or other experts in indigenous people's rights and issues. So those were the three uh, original suggestions. Then I will turn to the different sections of the draft legislation. Uh, the new section three, the right to be entered in the electoral role. 
um, in comparing the current version, the third version that that the expert mechanism have received of Section 3 uh, with the second version of Section 3, the expert mechanism welcomes the retention of the clarification in the explanation of the legislation that the criteria defining who is a Sami only relates to the right to vote in the elections of the Sami parliament and not who should be regarded as Sami in the first place. Thus, the presence of an individual on the electoral roll would not confer other, other rights except for the opportunity to vote and stand as candidate in the elections for the Sami parliament. So that means um, also um, showing to my previous presentation that membership issues, for instance, membership of a CEDA in reindeer husbandry uh, community, a community membership, etc. Uh, this will not in any way change the Sami customary way of uh, dealing with membership to those entities in Sami society. So the expert mechanism welcomes the um, retention of the requirements for both self-identification as Sami together with objective criteria and the affirmation that the subjective requirement must be accompanied by one or other of the two objective criteria for an individual to be recognized as a Sami for the purposes of this legislation. The expert mechanism also welcomes the removal of the precondition from the original legislation that allowed for the entry of persons on the electoral roll who are not considered Sami by the Sami parliament. All of these changes contribute towards enhancing the role of the Sami parliament and thus enhancing group recognition in establishing who is Sami for the purpose of the electoral role as suggested by the expert mechanism. The expert mechanism further notes that the only change in section three from the second draft received by the expert mechanism is the addition of a temporal period. The date January 1st, 2023 is the time by which at least one of the parents, one of the persons seek of the person seeking entrance on the roll must be registered as an eligible voter. This temporal addition appears to address the Human Rights Committee's findings of violations by Finland under its individual complaints procedure in two recent decisions adopted subsequent to the expert mechanism's mission and advice. And I will not go into detail since you already have received a presentation of the committee view, but the committee had found violations of the Sami people's right to effectively participate in public affairs by the extension of the electoral role to 97 new electors, thus adversely affecting the representative value of the Sami parliament. In February 2021, uh, the concluding observations of the Human Rights Committee expressed its concern that these decisions had not been implemented. And um, the expert mechanism is, of course, uh, very thankful also for the dialogue that we have with the Human Rights Committee. Um, we are trying also to strengthen our dialogue with the treaty bodies to make sure that uh, uh, we're transparent and fully informed about each other's um, work. We welcome this new temporal element in the draft legislation to the extent that it goes same, goes some way towards implementing the Human Rights Committee decision. And it also enhances the role of the Sami parliament in defining who is a Sami for the purposes of the electoral role. Then turning to chapter five, um, the expert mechanism welcomes the addition of a new chapter in the draft legislation, chapter five, which uh, proposes the establishment of an appeals board, a new independent and autonomous judicial body. The expert mechanism notes that members of the board will be proposed by the Sami parliament for government appointment, that the board will be independent and autonomous, relative to the election committee of the Sami parliament that decides on electoral role matters and also relative to the other body bodies of the Sami parliament. It will be fully resourced by the state. Uh, 
The expert mechanism notes uh, that this reassures its independence inter alia by the fact that a member or deputy member of the Sami parliament or the election committee or a person employed by the Sami parliament may not sit on the appeals board. The expert mechanism also notes that the board will make up of a chair, a legal member and two expert members and notes the explanation for the need for expertise. Um, the English version of the explanation in the in the English version of the explanation of the legislation. The expert mechanism would expect this body to be able to detect any discrimination in the process. The appeals board now proposed would operate under the auspices of the Sami parliament and for the expert mechanism, the establishment of this appeals board satisfied satisfies sorry, the expert mechanism's advice on establishing an individual claims process based on non-discrimination, taking a Sami culturally sensitive approach. We further note that appeals against decisions of the appeals board may be lodged within the Supreme Administrative Court, thus maintaining state oversight over the process. Given that the Sami parliament itself shall ensure the enjoyment of fundamental rights and human rights and treat all persons without discrimination in section uh, confer section five, and that the new appeals board should be in a position to demonstrate discrimination or arbitrariness in its reasoning, the expert mechanism questions whether such oversight is necessary. We also question whether it's com uh, compatible with Sami people's right to self-determination under Article 3 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We also note that it might not be compatible with the right to belong to the community in accordance with the traditions and customs, Article 9 of the Declaration. And we further note that the right to determine their own identity and membership in accordance with their customs and traditions under Article 33 of the Declaration, it might not be compatible with that article. Indeed, the explanation of the legislation also states that the appeals board meet the requirements of section 21, subsection 1 of the Constitution in Finland, which establishes the requirement of a general right to appeal a decision of a public authority concerning an individual to a judicial body, even in the absence of the right to further appeal a matter to the Supreme Administrative Court. However, the expert mechanism notes that the Human Rights Committee appears to be of the view that a state may exercise powers of oversight over procedures designed to facilitate the operation of indigenous people's democratic institutions, assuming such powers are applied carefully on the basis of reasonable and objective criteria and are consistent with the other provisions of the covenant including the principle of internal self-determination relating to indigenous peoples. In this regard, the expert mechanism notes that leave to appeal to the Supreme Administrative Court will only be granted for well-founded claims based on discrimination or arbitrariness. Regarding section nine, in our um, original advisory notes from 2018, we suggested that amendments to the substantive right to the act should include specific reference to relevant provisions of the declaration, notably articles 1, 3, 4, 17, 18, 19, 28, 29 and 32. The substantive parts of section 9 of the act Act should provide for the following elements as enshrined in the UN Declaration and entrenched in the Finnish state's emerging practices, as illustrated by the Ministry of Justice Memorandum. And now I list uh, its 10 points. One, pre-negotiation trust building initiatives. Two, good faith in the conduct of the consultation and in the pursuit of free prior and informed consent from the Sami people. Adequate resources to the Sami parliament, 
Four, equality of arms through the consultation period. Five, balanced capacity of the parties to engage throughout the process. Six, culturally appropriate methods of negotiation. Seven, impact assessments. That means human rights, cultural, environmental and social to be carried out when development projects are anticipated. Eight, a limitation of measures or projects which may cause significant harm to the Sami people's right as an indigenous peoples to practice their language, culture and traditional livelihoods and include a definition of what constitutes significant harm, including cumulative harm from competing land use forms in consultation with the Sami parliament beyond which development projects may not be undertaken. Protocols, uh, sorry, nine, protocols to be drawn up at the end of a process, including agreements reached, and in the case of opposing views, the reasons why the, uh, the views of the Sami were not taken on board. 10, a mechanism to monitor agreements and provide redress for non-compliance. Then I have some uh, comments on new section nine, the obligation to cooperate and negotiate. And I will not go into the details since it's already presented to all the participants in this uh, seminar, but I will turn to the comments from the expert mechanism. Um, so we note that section nine has been amended and it's now uh, been split into three long and very detailed subsections, strengthening the obligation to negotiate and giving more detail on how and when this obligation arises. This is supported by section five, which describes the role of the Sami parliament as inter alia promoting the implementation of Sami self-determination in accordance with section nine. In comparing the current version, which is the third version received by uh, the expert mechanism of Section 9, with the second version of Section 9, the expert mechanism welcomes the following. We welcome the retention of the extension of the obligation to negotiate to all actors providing public administrative tasks. The obligation to prepare a detailed record of the negotiation and the extension of the provision to all far reaching projects, the effects of which extend beyond the Sami homeland, even if they are implemented outside the actual homeland area. The expert mechanism welcomes the enhanced protection for Sami in that the obligation to negotiate arises when legislation, administrative decisions or other measures that may carry particular importance for the Sami people are under preparation. As opposed to the earlier draft relating to expansive or significant measures for the Sami. The expert mechanism notes that there is now a closed list of issues upon which the obligation to negotiate may arise. The expert mechanism respectfully suggests that a non-exhaustive approach may allow for future situations yet unconsidered, but, uh, but which may fall under Articles 19, 29 or 32 of the Declaration. The expert mechanism uh, also welcomes that uh, taken as a whole, Section 9 pays increased ref reference uh, to free prior and informed consent in this new draft, which should go some way towards implementing the relevant articles of the UN Declaration. It welcomes that many of the elements necessary for the purpose of ensuring free prior and informed consent in accordance with the Declaration are established in the legislation itself, as opposed to merely in the explanatory section which originally was the case. Such elements include the requirement to obtain consent in Section 9 and the requirement to assess the effects of measures on Sami in Section 9a. Section 9b sets out the procedure for cooperation 
and negotiations, including the emphasis on cooperation and good faith, time to prepare for the negotiation, early notification, receipt uh, of information ahead of negotiations, negotiations to be conducted, conducted in a timely manner, uh, recording the outcome of the process, possibility of influencing the process, as well as more detail on keeping a record of the uh, negotiation. The expert mechanism welcomes the strengthened language in section 9A, 9A, including the statement that the measure shall not cause considerable uh, detriment, as opposed to the last version, which stated that shall strive to ensure that significant detriment is not caused. While the expert mechanism respectfully suggests that some clarity of language could help tighten the text, we at the same time welcome the following essential elements that measures should not cause more than a minor impact on Sami rights. Measures that cause more than a minor impact must be justifiable in human rights terms and amount to a weighty social goal. A, a measure should not cause a detrimental impact on Sami rights. The expert mechanism also welcomes that in assessing detrimental impact, cumulative impact is included as part of the definition. The assessment should take into account that combined impact of the activities of the different public authorities and the measures taken at different times. However, the expert mechanism notes that Section 9 does not use the language of the Declaration on Free, Prior and Informed Consent. This, in our opinion, may leave room for different interpretations on when free, prior and informed is, uh, free, prior and informed consent is required. The expert mechanism reiterates our suggestion on this issue which we expressed already in August 2018, including that the text could be improved by adopting the language of Articles 19 and 32 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples more closely. In particular, the language on free, prior and inform, informed consent. And I would also remind you that the expert mechanism have actually a separate study on the free prior and informed consent from 2018, uh, which I can share with you in the chat later on. As set out, out in this report from 2018, the free prior and informed consent concept is not alone in the UN Declaration. It is also guaranteed through the interpretation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and in the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination by the Treaty Bodies of the United Nations. As recent as March 2021, in the context of a review of Finland's seventh periodic report, the Committee on Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights expressed its concern at the lack of a legal obligation to conduct consultations with a view of obtaining the free prior and informed consent of the Sami on matters that affect their lands and resources. The committee urged the state party to strengthen the legal recognition of the Sami as indigenous peoples and the legal and procedural guarantees for obtaining the free prior and informed consent of the Sami in line with international standards. Then in May 2021, the Human Rights Committee expressed its concern about reports that vague criteria used to assess the impact of measures, including development projects on Sami culture and traditional livelihoods, have resulted in the authorities' failure to engage in meaningful consultations to obtain the free prior and informed consent of the Sami. It urged the state to and I quote, speed up the process of revisiting the Sami Parliament Act, in particular its sections three on the definition of Sami and nine on the principle of free prior and informed consent with a view to respecting the Sami people's right to self-determination. Self 
and review existing legislation, policies and practices with a view to ensuring in practice meaningful consultation with the Sami people uh, with a view to obtain their free prior and informed consent. End of quote. I then conclude this um, presentation that originally Megan David, uh, Davis should present to you. And I apologize uh, for any uh, questions that might not be answered, but I reassure you that the expert mechanism is still following this process and we welcome the opportunity to comment on this draft and to also uh, continue the dialogue both with the Sami Parliament and the Government of Finland. Thank you so much, Geert. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. We have a question for you also uh, on this matter, and the question is from Martin Sheinin. Does MRIP have a definition for the notion of ethnic? There is a great deal of confusion in Finland because ethnic is often used as a synonym for racial, just removing the unscientific categorization into races. But many would relate ethnic more to genes than to culture. And the question is, when MRIP refers to ethnic Finns, is this a reference to genes slash blood or a way of life slash culture? Um, thank you, Martin, for that question. Um, uh, you refer to the text that I just, the advice, the follow up response to the draft amendments that we, uh, that I referred to. And I have first to say that the expert mechanism doesn't have a definition for the notion of ethnic. And also uh, when we use uh, in this document the term ethnic, um, it's just a ref mere reference to life or culture. It's not a reference to any um, kind of unscientific categorization into races. Um, so it's it's just a way of saying it's not like a legal term, but it's more a reference to uh, differing cultures that Finns uh, compare to the Sami, uh, that they have um, different cultures and different ways of life. Um, so it's not it's not in any way meant to be any. Um, like a different concept uh, when it comes to the expert mechanism documents. So I hopefully that was a, a good answer. Thank you. And that concludes our, our session number two, and uh, we will now launch session three that was supposed to start at three. We are running about half an hour late, so apologies for that. Uh, but this session is presentations, comments and questions by Finnish experts and Finnish or Sami politicians. And uh, part of this session may be in Finnish uh, and uh, part of it in English. I'd like to welcome Professor Tuomas Ojanen from University of Helsinki. And his topic is assessing the proposal by the Drafting Commission from the perspective of the Constitution of Finland. The floor is yours, Tuomas Ojanen. Good afternoon. And Greetings from Helsinki. It's my great pleasure to participate in this seminar and I welcome this opportunity to present my views on the proposals by the working group. Uh, as indicated by the program, my assignment in this panel is about as assessing the proposals by the drafting committee from the perspective of the constitution of Finland. As, and as I'm much more obedient nowadays than I was in secondary school, I try to do the job now. My talk is structured as follows. First, I will briefly outline the constitutional framework for assessing the proposed legislative package. And after having done that, I will assess the proposed amendments from the perspective of the Constitution. However, I hurry up to add that rather than attempting to be exhaustive and final, my assessment will be preliminary and selective. 
Uh, my assessment is selective because my focus is only on section three on the right to be entered in the electoral role on the one hand and chapter five on appeals in matters concerning the electoral role on the other hand. Of course, this is not to deny the importance of other amendments. For instance, the proposed amendments in sections nine, section nine A, section nine B that relate to the obligation to cooperate and negotiate. For instance, of course, they are of, of, of uh, supreme significance too, but in order to save some time, I will focus on just section three and chapter five. And my assessment on those will be pre preliminary and in broad outline simply because I think that a thorough assessment of the compatibility of the proposed amendments with the Constitution will have to wait until the government proposal is finalized and completed. Later, I will give some further directions to the Ministry of Justice when it's finalizing the government, government bill and governmental proposal in general. But let me now start by outlining the essence of the constitutional framework for assessing uh, the proposed amendments. Uh, once simplified, there are three distinct yet interrelated provisions in the constitution that combine to make up the essence of the constitutional uh, framework. The most important section is section 17, subsection 3, providing that the Sami as an indigenous people have the right to maintain and develop their own language and culture. Provisions on the right of the Sami to use Sami language before the authorities are laid down by an act. Uh, as you can see, this provision, no more and no less, but acknowledges that the Sami are an indigenous people who enjoy cultur cultural and linguistic rights. But one looks in vain after any definition what an indigenous people is and what may constitute possibly criteria for the membership of the Sami as an indigenous people. Um, and if we take a look at the preparatory works of this section and, and constitutional provisions on fundamental rights in general, uh, they remain also silent, totally silent in this regard. The other, aside from section 17, subsection 3, constitutional framework, or at least the essence of it, is constituted by section 22, which provides that the public authorities shall guarantee the observance of basic rights and liberties and human rights. Uh, once simplified, this provision entails both negative and positive obligations on public authorities. And I think that it's now important to note that, at least in my view, uh, the proposed amendments should be understood so that they primarily seek to fulfill all those positive obligations under the Constitution and international human rights treaties that relate to the Sami as an indigenous people. So the perspective of consideration is uh, profoundly different than in the case of legislative proposals that entail interferences uh, to fundamental and human rights. This is not the case now, in my view, at least. Uh, the third major constitutional provision is section 121, subsection 4, basically pro uh, providing that in their nation, native region, the Sami have linguistic and cultural self-government as provided uh, by an act. The main added value of this provision is to lift into attention that the Sami, as an indigenous people, also enjoy self-governance insofar as their language and culture 
uh, are concerned. Of course, these three constitutional provisions, they do not exhaust the spectrum of constitutional law framework. For instance, there may be a need to take notice of Section 6 that includes the general equality clause and the prohibition of discrimination. And later on, I will also mention Section 21, uh, which enshrines the fundamental right to protection under the law. Uh, but we cannot enter the details of these potential constitutional provisions right now. Uh, finally, it deserves emphasis that the constitutional tendency in Finland has been towards what can be called the harmonization of the constitutional and inst international protection of fundamental and human rights since the mid 90s onwards. Therefore, international human rights norms as seen in light of the interpretive practice of international treaty bodies must also be taken into account when interpreting these constitutional provisions that enshrine uh, the rights of the Sami as an indigenous people. For instance, several opinions by the Constitutional Law Committee of Parliament, which is the primary authority of constitutional review and interpretation here in Finland uh, includes explicit references to Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and its interpretive practice by the United Nations Human Rights Committee. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, let me now start briefly assessing proposed amendments from the perspective of this constitutional law framework. To start with, uh, the proposed draft amendments to the Sami Parliament, Parliament Act can, in my view, be welcomed as a significant step in the right direction. I congratulate the working group for its excellent work that really can change the direction and even pave the way for the ratification of the convention number 169 of the International Labour Organization. And the proposals may also pave the way for further process aiming at uh, getting further the Nordic Sami Convention. In essence, I think that sections 17, 22 and 121 of the Constitution of Finland, as outlined above, combine to require that the Sami Parliament, as a representative and implementing institution of the linguistic and cultural rights and self government uh, of the Sami, must play a major role in deciding who is a Sami for the purpose of registration on the electoral roll. One of the basic requirements by the Constitution and international human rights law also is that the definition of a Sami should be guided by the primary objective of preserving Sami culture through enhanced group recognition of who is Sami in accordance with their traditions and customs and also respect of the right of internal self-determination of the Sami people should also direct and determine the Sami Parli Parliament Act thoroughly. In my view, amendments proposed by the working group neatly and quite well reflect these fundamental requirements and accordingly they succeed in promoting the opportunities of the Sami as an indigenous people to influence matters concerning their linguistic and cultural rights and self-government. From the perspective of the Finnish constitution, I regard these proposed amendments, especially taken as a whole, as being great leaps forward, even if there may be still need for some fine tuning here and there. As I already said in the very beginning, one of the most significant amendments proposed by the working group relate to section 
free entitled the right to be entered in the electoral roll. I think that the title alone is a significant step in the right direction because the title already clearly informs us that the issue is no more and no less than about the criteria for entry on the electoral roll rather than defining who is Sami. Hence, entering a person to the electoral roll is not intended to confer no other rights except for the opportunity to vote and stand as a candidate in the elections of the Sami parliament. And this is also fully in, li fully in harmony with the statements by the Constitutional Law Committee of Parliament that the rights belonging to the Sami should not be linked to the definition of a Sami laid down in section three of the Act on the Sami Parliament. I also hope that this amendment to section three will also dispel those very common misunderstandings that the definition laid out in section three would effectively also generate a bundle of other rights such as land, land rights or similar rights of financial or, or economic significance. By and large, amendments proposed to section three appear legitimate and justified from the perspective of the constitution because these changes contribute towards enhancing the role of the Sami parliament and thus enhancing group recognition in establishing who is Sami for the purpose of the electoral role, especially if it takes simultaneously into account what is proposed in, in chapter five, for instance. The proposed amendments to section three also succeed, in my view, in appropriately observing those decisions by the United, by the Human Rights Committee, in which the committee found a violation of the Sami people's rights by Finland, in practice because of those judgments by the Supreme Administrative Court that have already been discussed earlier today. I just make a reference to those that earlier discussion today to avoid unnecessary repetition. I cannot enter the amendments proposed to section three in detail. In my view, it now suffices just to say that more information on the effects of new section three on the right to be entered in the electoral role is needed before the compatibility of section three with the constitution can assessed in great depth. I mean that the draft governmental bill government bill now remains silent on how many persons currently entered in the electoral roll will no longer uh, enjoy such a right if the amendment proposed by the working group to section three enters in the force. Once we know better the effects of the proposed amendments on the people, we are in a better footing to assess, for instance, the need for a transition provision that might alleviate the effects of section three. So one of my advices is to the Ministry of Justice that those sections of the proposal dealing with the impact assessments of the proposed amendment should be elaborated. In light of that information, we can then much better assess whether the proposed recompilation of electoral roll from scratch on the basis of a new criteria is, is compatible with the constitution and international human rights treaties binding upon Finland. Let me now start devoting my final part, devoting final part of my talk to amendments proposed to chapter five on appeals in matters concerning the electoral law. Again, my preliminary assessment on, of amendments proposed to chapter five from the perspective of the constitution is positive. Especially 
the proposed provisions on the appeals board are most welcome as they neatly reflect the right of internal self-determination. As the chair of the National Non-Discrimination and Equality Tribunal, which is an impartial and independent judicial body appointed by the government, I'm able to compare the proposed legislation on the appeals board with the legislation regula regulating our tribunal's organization and procedure. And let me now just tell you that the proposed legislation on the appeals boards succeeds in securing the na nature of the board as an impartial and independent judicial body much better than the current act on the National Non-Discrimination and Equality Tribunal. In my view, the proposed provisions on the appeals board combine to guarantee that the appeals board would be other independent organ for the administration of justice within the meaning of section 22, subsection 1 of the Constitution. Likewise, the appeal board would qualify as an independent and impartial tribunal established by law within the meaning of Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the Euro European Human Rights Convention, as well as it would qualify as a court or a tribunal of a member state within the meaning of Article 267 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, essentially providing what is called preliminary rulings procedure in which a court or a tribunal of a member state of the European Union can ask for a preliminary ruling by the European Court of Justice on the interpretation of EU law if that interpretation is, is necessary to enable a national court or a tribunal to give a, to give a judgment. One significant dimension of the proposed amendments in Chapter 5 relates to appeals against decisions of the Appeals Board. These decisions may be appealed to, to the Supreme Administrative Court for the purpose of maintaining outside state oversight over the decision-making process on electoral matters. However, leave to appeal to the Supreme Administrative Court will only be granted for well-founded claims based on discrimination or arbitrariness. Hence, the grounds for appeal would be much more limited than in other situation, situations. And I do know that the Supreme Administrative Court has already criticized quite heavily the proposed grounds for appeal. But I think that the limiting grounds, that limiting the grounds for appeal in the manner proposed by the working group is well justified for the purpose of respecting what is one of the fundamental requirements in this whole complex of issues now at hand. That is to say, respect of the right of internal self-determination of the Sami people. In my view, this requirement does not only mean that the Supreme Administrative Court should exercise its judicial review against the backdrop of a judicial self-restraint. I think that the right of internal self-determination of the Sami people also makes it legitimate and justified to curtail grounds for appeal from those that they usually are in the context of other matters. I think that we really must try to go beyond the conventional in this context, and we cannot fall into the trap of applying ossified tradi traditional ways of organizing appeals against decisions of the appeals board. In conclusion, the proposed chapter five appears to be, at least by and large, compatible with the constitution in my view. Actually, I dare to go even a bit further than what is now proposed in Chapter 5. In my view, it would be worthwhile to ponder whether the competent quorum of the Supreme Administrative Court should include expert members 
with expertise and knowledge of the Sami as indigenous people when the Europe, uh, when the Supreme Administrative Court is dealing with appeals against decisions of the appeals board. After all, administrative courts have so-called expert members knowledgeable in various matters such as child welfare or mental health cases and there are also expert members in the Supreme Administrative court, court in some environmental matters, for instance. So not, why not enhance expertise and knowledge of the Supreme Administrative Court on the Sami when the Supreme Administrative Court decides appeals against decisions of the appeals board? As I said, we really need to go beyond the conventional thinking now. Thanks for attending. Thank you, Professor Tuomas Ojanen. And uh, we have a question also for you. And the question comes from Martin Sheinin. And the question is, how could the impact of amending Section 3 be assessed when we cannot know how amending the criteria will affect the presentation of reasons and evidence when applying for inclusion in the electoral role, also by persons who earlier were admitted by the Supreme Administrative Court overall consideration? Good question. Easier said than done, of course. Uh, but perhaps at least something can be said on the effects of this new proposed Section 3. Now, I know that, that the draft government proposal remained totally silent on the issue. There was no information whatsoever, but of course it's not so easy to come up, come up with any very exact information in this regard, but perhaps something is needed for the purpose of, for instance, pondering the necessity of, of transition provision for the purpose of alleviating the effects of, of Section 3. But there is this attempt to start from scratch and, and I appreciate it and, and basically approach it quite positively from the perspective of the Constitution. So I understand the approach by the working group in this regard, but still perhaps something can be said just to inform at least a bit about the effects of this provision. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Tuomas Ojanen. And now we move on, uh, and I'd like to welcome Professor Veli-Pekka Lehtola from University of Oulu. And his topic is identity and membership of the Sami people according to the customs and traditions of the Sami. The floor is yours, Veli-Pekka Lehtola. Hello to all. I'm Veli-Pekka Lehtola, Professor of uh, Sami Cultural Studies at the uh, University of Oulu in Kielakas Institute. Uh, my paper is a little different than, than the former ones because uh, I'm not a researcher of law or even uh, social studies, but, uh, but cultural studies. So I'm a Sami researcher and, um, and uh, a cultural historian. So, so this is uh, from, these are the perspectives that uh, I'm going to speak uh, from uh, when dealing with the practices of ethnic uh, recognition, uh, which, uh, which uh, Laila Susanne was uh, especially referring to earlier. So, so the kinship-based uh, practice of ethnic recognition is a traditional custom uh, among the Sami to define the belonging and the membership uh, in the Sami community. And uh, in the contemporary situation in which the indigenous rights of the Sami are contested in several ways in Finland, this internal practice has become heavily politicized and uh, object of external definition. 
So uh, it's an oral and uh, embodied tradition and uh, living practice in Sami society. And so this is why I, uh, this is also a question to the, to the uh, legal uh, representatives of legal studies that, uh, that uh, how much is it considered to be uh, legally a vital social and customary law institution uh, uh, in the legislation. And uh, Laila Susanne was uh, talking about the collective recognition and, and this is one of the uh, most important uh, customs of that collective recognition. Well, uh, it's already a, a set uh, phrase to say that when, when the two or more Sami are meeting, uh, if they are strange uh, to, other, uh, to each other, they, they will ask that Kiton Lech in their languages. Here you can see in No Sami, in Arisami, it's called Sami languages. But it's not only who you are, but uh, also to whom you belong to. And uh, if I may, I could uh, use our chair as an as an example, because uh, if you if we ask our chair that who are you, and then Keaton left, uh, she will probably say, "Mullan is komehte piiret." Piirita näkkelär viis a Finnish form, and then the, uh, that is uh, the Sami form. And that uh, includes that uh, she is a daughter of Mah Mahte or Matti, whose father was Isku or Isko. And uh, here he, she she would be defining herself according to her father, father, and uh, three generations of uh, reindeer Sami family, positioning her to the reindeer Sami community and then the Sami context in general. And another possibility that uh, that uh, Pirita was using in the morning when she was introducing herself uh, is Chiskyanne Mareha Piret. Uh, if she's introducing to people who might know her mother better, maybe, or, or it was interesting what, what was the reason to, to choose this one. But when we are talking about this, then we are talking about another kin, another context, and uh, and uh, that widens the the context uh, even more. So uh, with this uh, recognition, um, uh, you you are referring to people living in a certain area using certain lands, uh, but uh, belonging to us. Uh, this is an example of a system of uh, the traditional way of knowing, maintaining and regulating uh, the cohesion, togetherness, boundaries of Sami communities. And uh, this is transferred from generation to generation. This uh, system, of course, varies in detail between different Sami groups, which in Finland are Anna Sami, Tetno Sami, Reindeer Sami, Skolt Sami, maybe maybe uh, watch your Sami and so on. But uh, there are vast oral networks of uh, this social knowledge so, uh, over boundaries informing uh, Keith on that, that uh, not everyone one in Sami community knows about uh, very deeply about this, this, uh, 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 this knowledge, but uh, there are experts in every community who who know that, uh, and uh, that's why it's uh, it's not only your your own community, but also the Sami communities in in a wider scale. And this uh, system is still functioning despite modernization and the social change. Uh, although in nowadays it uh, may need more defining when the Sami area, Sami land uh, has been widened. For instance, rap artist Nikke Ankara says to be Nillasa Nillas, Kare Maria Merja Nillas. So there is five generations. So it goes five generations back to make sure. And you can see that uh, in, in that Sami form, there can be both uh, men's names and women's names in the in the same 
uh, depending on who was the uh, better known person in, in the community. Well, uh, let's go back, uh, back to history. So, uh, during the Sami debate in Finland, it has been argued that uh, earlier in history, the locals did not recognize precise ethnic boundaries, since uh, even the concept ethnicity is, uh, is a modern word. In, in reality, uh, ethnic boundaries have always been there, with, uh, but they, they have been there with different names. And uh, when I studied uh, the, the uh, Sami history in Finland, for uh, uh, during the uh, last uh, recent uh, 100 years, 150 years, uh, I, I concluded that uh, there was locally very exact knowledge who were Sami or Lap in Finnish, Lappalainen in Finnish, and who were Lattelas or Lantalainen or Finn. Uh, so, so that uh, that was quite uh, clear result. And uh, another claim is that different Sami groups did not perceive, uh, perceive themselves Sami belo or belonging to Sami people in history. They had uh, not that sense. But uh, my result was that uh, there was a very strong sense of mutual belonging, uh, which was reflected in Sami languages. Uh, because there are, uh, are different forms of the concept Sami in each Sami language, as well as uh, when the Sami were using Finnish language, they were talking, for instance, about Lapin Suku, uh, Lapkin, referring to shared origins between different Sami groups. Thus, uh, this uh, system was not arbitrary or random, but uh, but. Uh, a system, uh, as I said, and uh, it was not about um, consciously uh, uh, excluding people, but the custom of defining our people, and it's a very human act to do. It has been done uh, in every uh, uh, every historical period and uh, and globally uh, to define uh, who are us and who are others. Um, well, about uh, becoming a Sami in, in history, I use this uh, uh, term Samification. I, I don't know if it's right, but the becoming a, a Finn become, becoming a Sami. And my claim is that no Finn could become a Sami by herself or himself. Uh, it was uh, only her or his descendants or, or offspring offspring who could uh, uh, become Sami. Uh, it, it individual could not decide uh, about uh, the belonging to the Sami community. There are cases of somebody living in a lap way, as it was uh, said in the, in the archive materials, but uh, he or she was not considered as a lap or, or a Sami which is very well reflected in this uh, separate observation that, uh, uh, yes, there is somebody who is living like a son. Well, uh, this uh, only by marrying a Sami, uh, the, the Samification could be possible during few generations because it was observed and followed that if, uh, if they choose the Sami or the Finnish way of life, concerning especially the language, clothing, belonging uh, to the Finnish or Sami family or kin. And uh, I, I would also emphasize that uh, it was not a, a question about modernity or something like that, because uh, you could also have a modern Sami uh, way of life. And uh, it seems that in the Sami core areas, for instance, in that or Utsuki area, it was more usual for Finns to become Sami. And in other areas, for instance, in Tormani Ivalo area, there was even a pressure for Sami to become Finns. And uh, other areas are, are between these, these uh, 
uh, they were more more cross cultural in a way. Thus, uh, I, I I will come back to this uh, uh, this uh, title of mine. Uh, this uh, practice of ethnic rec recognition uh, is uh, a way of locating people on the social map. And uh, I consider it as an indigenous knowledge system which is conducted socially as a cultural tradition of an indigenous group. And within the contemporary state system, however, the membership in the Sami community has been discussed uh, as a question of individual rights and identity, in which the demands of the Sami for for this collective recognition have been seen even as a contrast for uh, democratic values. And uh, be, so this means that people's own understanding is not taken seriously compared to the, to the uh, maybe literal under understanding of the Western legislation and, and Western categories. So, uh, we have we wrote uh, with Walkonen and Walkonen an article about this a few years ago, and uh, our conclusion was that such uh, developments can be seen as part of a complex colonialist uh, situation in which both the political foundations of the Sami community and the international legal discourse on indigenous rights and cultural heritage are constrained by structural, uh, structural relations of domination. And uh, yes, uh, the, the question is about this, uh, this uh, uh, is this uh, a legal, legally uh, uh, relevant system, uh, uh, this, uh, this way of, uh, of uh, recognizing uh, people or us. Yes, thank you. Kihtu Takka Spaseb. Thank you, Professor Veli-Pekka Lehtola. But let's start um, by the question by Martin Schenin to Professor Lehtola. To what extent are the rules you described understood as binding norms? Um, yes, it's a it's an interesting question. Are they binding? Um, uh, I would say that uh, um, I'm not a researcher of, of legal studies, so so I don't know how to how to answer that. But uh, but at least uh, they were normative. No, they were, they have been uh, like norms in a way that uh, that uh, as you follow follow some rules in the social social um, cooperation and and uh, social life. So, so this is also something like that that. Uh, if you don't follow these these ways, then then you are not uh, not uh, restricted out, but uh, but maybe maybe uh, at least people are wondering what uh, what uh, are you doing. 